I talk about pneumonia and diarrhea diseases. And so there is every need for us to join hands to, together to make sure we, we, we eradicate malaria. And then the medical and research network, we have joined hands from day one with several players around the world. The WHO, the Global Malaria Program, the Rollback Malaria, and every I mean, player or stakeholders around the globe, we have joined hands with them. And indeed, we have seen some efforts being, being I mean, PC, do you have the slides? Um, we can see some efforts um, around the globe. Since since 2000, we have actually seen a decline in the in the in the, in the burden of malaria around the world, especially in the vulnerable children. And then it is a special pleasure because this is a combined effort. Even I was a board member of the Rollback Malaria for the Southern Constituency, and uh, it's 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 something we hope it continues because before 2009, 2008. It was like every 30 seconds, a child around the world dies from malaria. But now it goes down to every two minutes, um, which is really, really encouraging. So um, most of this statistic will be shown very soon again by, by the other players. But indeed, uh, it's a special pleasure for me to join hands with this wonderful team, the BDG, and all the, the panelists that will be um, scheduled to speak this afternoon. So that at least together we can join hands in a sort of complementing the efforts of the organization, the UN and the sub-agency, the WHO, the country level offices, the Minister of Health, the political will, and everything we can do to reduce the burden of malaria. We are on good path. I will continue the effort with persistence. We think we can really conquer malaria and, and bring it to, to a logical conclusion and scientific conclusion. And we have heard about recent vaccines, which is very, very, very exciting. And we hope that um, it continues in this, in this, in this, in this regard. Um, the slides will come up later, um, but we hope uh, we have set the stage to see how urgent it is, how important it is for us all to join hands, so that we can um, 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 eliminate malaria totally from the from this wonderful world it's one of the best social legacies we can live if we can do that and we do continue to join hands with big scientists big innovators big I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, proactive people like Dr. Tom Collars with whom I've had the, the, the honor of working around the whole of Africa running mobile clinics and introducing his tools in different societies that could have definitely helped to bring down the burden of malaria so I think with this short um, um, intervention, and I hope I've laid the stage, and then and I'm all ears to listen to the, to, the, to the powers that be, so that at least we continue this wonderful effort in bringing the burden of malaria to a scientific and logical conclusion. It needs concerted effort. It needs all of our input. Nobody is small to make a, ch a change, and nothing is small in, in bringing an impact. So please. Um, I thank you very much. I thank Dr. Bisi for this wonderful opportunity. And then as the motto of the medical and research network says, together we can make it happen. And indeed, together we can bring malaria to a logical conclusion so that at least I mean, we, we, we are free from this burden. I thank you very much and then we continue. Okay, thank you so much, um, Dr. Senesi. Um, on this note, I would like to introduce our different um, speakers so that you can, you know, see them close up on the um, on the PowerPoint. Um, yeah. So we have Her Excellency. I need to share my screen. Okay. So we have Her Excellency Dr. Linda Ayade. She's uh, the wife of the uh, of the governor of uh, Cross River State. She's also the founder and president of Mediatrix, a development founding uh, foundation in Cross River State. They've done a lot of work. Um, she's a medical doctor by profession. She's also the ambassador for maternal health in her state. She's done a lot of work in um, eliminating 
different uh, problems uh, faced by women and girls. Um, we also have with us um, Ms. Olivier Ngo. Olivier is from Cameroon. She's um, the founder of the Secretariat for Civil Society for Malaria Elimination. She's also the founder of um, Impact Health, another um, organization, the civil society in Eastern Cameroon. Uh, Ms. Abena Foku works with uh, Medicine for Malaria Venture. She's a project manager there. Uh, she has, um, I think I'll stop here and let everybody, you know, <laughs> talk about themselves so that I don't take too much time as you, you know, introduce yourself. So I will first of all like to call on Her Excellency to, you know, open the floor for us this afternoon. Yeah. Mute. Sorry, she needs to unmute. I don't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry, I didn't know I was still on mute. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be a part of this discussion this afternoon. Um, um, it's always uh, gladdens my heart when we have opportunities to talk about um, disease burdens that um, are really a problem in our part of the world. So yeah, I'm glad to be here this afternoon. Um, thank you once again. I don't know if it is just the introduction or you want me to go on. Please, you can go into your presentation. To say more. Yes, please go on. Okay, yes, like you rightly said, um, I, um, I preside over my foundation, Mediatrix Development Foundation, MDF for short. And um, it is, I will just sum it to say, it is a health promoting um, foundation. I mean, just based on my profession, those are my um, passions, you know, and it has, uh, anything that has to do with health is what I like to handle. So that's what led me to um, bringing up that foundation to see how I help to reduce the burden of communicable and non-communicable diseases in cross river state, especially as my husband sits as governor to see how I can support the weak health um, sector in the state. So basically, Mediatrix Development Foundation, and uh, we actually started out, our first project was on malaria. We decided that we should catch them young. We had to go into um, schools, secondary schools precisely, and we decided to form mar malaria clubs across all the um, the secondary schools, uh, the government-owned secondary schools in the states. Form malaria clubs, and um, the the reason behind that was that that would give us a good um, a good a good foundation to be able to to reach out to the young ones and catch them young in preventive measures as it concerns malaria, because we know that when it comes to malaria, there are some preventive burden of the disease. They are more malleable to training, they are more responsive. So we wanted to really groom them, advocate through those channels, for clean environments and other uh, malaria related preventive measures. So we formed those clubs across schools. Um, like I said, um, it's the government owned schools across the three senatorial districts. Unfortunately for us, um, Etisalat was then known as Etisalat, which is now called Nine Mobile. They were also looking for a, a, a similar kind of platform for them to. Uh, reach out to the young ones on um, malaria also. So it just happened that at that same time, we already have formed the clubs and it just became a good platform for them to come in. So they helped us to equip those schools, those clubs in those schools with um, a desktops, desktops whereby we load the softwares um, with all those informations 
concerning the prevention of malaria, keeping your environment clean, um, uh, preventing stag uh, uh, stagnant water, and all of that, and a lot more. So we, in fact, we, be, we started using that, those platforms to reach out to the young ones across board, many more issues, because a lot of times we want to uh, start with the young ones. So it became a very good platform for, um, for many other uh, outreaches, as long as we wanted to reach the children. So that has helped us a lot. That has helped us a lot um, in the advocacy for the prevention of malaria. And um, in addition to that, we also partner with the state Ministry of, um, of Health and the Primary Healthcare Development Agency. We, my foundation, we ha I have a lot of volunteers who work with me. So we help to uh, distribute the uh, insecticide treated uh, nets across, especially in the rural areas. Um, we, we help to distribute to pregnant women, distribute to the elderly ones, distribute, um, especially when also we have, because periodically, um, Midratrix Development Foundation, I organ we organize health outreaches for the rural population. So we use, um, we, we take leverage of that and um, also distribute the insecticide treated nets. Um, then we advocate and let the people know. I, uh, I, I believe you know that a lot of times there's our people practice self-medication. When they have fever, they just assume it's malaria. Um, they just buy drugs across the counter and sometimes they don't buy the right ones. Sometimes they, they don't take the right dosage and all of that. So we use those opportunities to reach out to them, to do the testing, uh, massive testing when we are doing our outreaches, um, malaria testing specifically I'm talking about, and then we, we go ahead to give them um, drugs as well. And so, and then let them know that it is better for you to test when you have fever. The test is just, it just takes a little, a, a little time and it's, it doesn't cost so much. And then also we make it free for them anyway. So, for them to test because not all fever is malaria. So that also helps to reduce the mortality burden um, because misdiagnosis is one of the reasons we have high mortality when it comes to uh, malaria treatment. So we do a lot of that under malaria in addition to every other thing we do. I'm talking more malaria because uh, we are on the topic of malaria today. So, um, so far, I want to give you some little statistics of what we have achieved, we have been able to um, to reach at least eighteen thousand uh, uh, people with testing. The testing, the free testing services that we render um, in the states across the three senatorial districts that we have, we have provided at least a thousand seven hundred and forty something um, insecticides to people that we have distributed through my foundation alone. And um, we have been able to reach at least 40,000, at least 40,000 persons, advocacy messages, awareness messages on the primary focus. Um, and um, we have had um, um, medical outreaches. These medical outreaches, Initially, when I started it, I thought that it was just going to be for the rural population. But I find out that when we go there, um, a lot of people, a lot of people, even from across the borders from other states, they come to benefit from it. Once they know that it's free, they come out. And then we realize that um, a lot of people, when they are sick, either they are seeking help from just like. like uh, Said before from the drugs and for a long time, sign and symptom of any other disease. And then they come up with a lot more. So uh, complete, the malaria is now complicated and it becomes an issue. They become anemic and all of that. So um, basically I found out that there was so much to do. And then the crowd is always overwhelming. When they hear that it's free medical outreach, they come out in their numbers. So we started needing um, help from other organizations because we couldn't handle the crowds. 
unfortunately, as God will have it, it's, it's always providing help when we need it. We now had um, um, a, 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 a body of doctors and nurses who have who had come together for an organization. They always look out, look for a place where they can also go and render free services. So we partnered with them, and every now and again they come with us. Apart from the ones that we used to draw from the states to go, they come with us, and we have a real massive um, outreach. So on that, we have been able to touch over 4, 40,000 people, I would say, and um, we keep that going as it is. So basically, that is um, summarily what Mediatrix Development Foundation has been doing concerning malaria. And um, we keep trying to do new things. Presently, we, we have had another partnership with um, Breakthrough Action Nigeria, which is um, which is um, a project of the USAID. So they have come to partner with us also, trying to use the base, the school clubs as the base because they are also seeking to have school-based social and behavioral um, change advocacy, and they want to they want it for the young ones. They want to catch the young ones, so they are using our school clubs also. So. The idea of the school clubs has come out to be a very good one because it's just a template for so many other things. So many, so many times people want to reach out to children, they want to come to our school clubs and that has formed um, a very formidable front for us. Um, but unfortunately, um, COVID came, COVID happened last year and most of the schools were closed for a very long time. So we were inactive for a very long time, but fortunately now, and all thanks to God, the schools are open. And so we are beginning to bring things back in shape. So basically that is it from my end. Thank you. Missy, you unmute yourself. Missy, you unmute Hello. yourself. Oh, okay, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Linda. Uh, that's quite impressive. Um, and I'm sure you, you know, you're doing amazing work there and a lot of lives have been saved through your efforts. Um, today's event is to raise awareness, share experiences and uh, pick up lessons learned from, you know, from the different projects. The idea is to go from, you know, from local grassroots to global, but we are going to move things a little bit around um, this afternoon. So before we, you know, move on to the next um, speaker, I'll quickly like to share briefly the agenda. No, I don't need to share that. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. So let me call on uh, Dr. Perpetua Umoibi. She's the national coordinator and um, director for the Malaria Elimination Program in Nigeria. Uh, she's also a medical doctor. She'll be able to share experiences on what Nigeria is doing and how they are doing. I don't know if she can um, assess herself or we'll be able to do that for her. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, BC, thank you for this uh, opportunity. Uh, BC and I have been friends for ages. Remember, I think we, we met in my Geneva days. Yeah. But it's great to see you again after a while. Yeah, and um, yeah, so like you said, I am the uh, current uh, national coordinator of what some countries call program manager for the National Malaria Animation Program, the Federal Ministry of Health. And before that, I've worked uh, about for about eight years now uh, within the malaria space in the Federal Ministry of Health. I was uh, the director for the sub and head of the surveillance monitor and evaluation in the National Malaria Program before my recent uh, appointment as the national coordinator. Uh, so um, that is briefly uh, my, my background. So in terms of the National Malaria Mission Program, what we do is that we, we have the mandate for coordinating all the malaria related activities at the national and sub-national level in the country to, you know, by providing a, a technical support, policy, guide, guidelines and strategies 
for malaria implementation in Nigeria. So far, we have uh, the, the National Malaria Mission Program has uh, walked through three uh, national malaria strategy plan, and currently we're on the fourth one, which we developed um, uh, last year, to which will take us between 2021 and 2025. And this new malaria strategic plan is to is to which has a goal of uh, Nigeria attaining a malaria prevalence of less than 10 percent parasite prevalence by 2025, and achieving a, a reduction in uh, malaria deaths in children under five uh, that are malaria related deaths to less than 50 deaths per 1,000 life births. That is the, the, the goal of the current strategic plan. And we have uh, different strategies and interventions that are, have been outlined within this current strategic plan that would help us to achieve uh, these targets by 2025. I don't know if you want me to go into that, but briefly, that is uh, uh, the work. And then these strategies are long prevention strategies, like uh, what the first lady had mentioned. And then we have uh, uh, diagnosis uh, treatment, malaria management, uh, and then we also have uh, supporting interventions like the procurement and supply chain, uh, advocacy, communication, and social mobilization, program management and coordination, as well as uh, surveillance, monitor evaluation, and operations research, all within the program to ensure that uh, we, we effectively roll out this strategy that we have. In terms of the strategy, primarily the, the uh, under prevention, uh, but maybe before that, I, I, you may want to, to know, although it's public knowledge, our malaria situation in the country. Malaria, uh, Mal uh, Nigeria tops uh, the countries with the highest burden of malaria globally. And so from the 2021 malaria report, Nigeria accounted for about 27% of the global malaria cases and 23% of the global malaria deaths from the 20, uh, 2019 data, and that uh, you know you know translated to about um, about ninety thousand deaths per year, and uh, over about over about sixty thousand cases of malaria yearly. And uh, at the same time, the the the, the, the picture looks uh, dismal, but at the same time, we have made some progress in in the country. In bringing down the burden and death in malaria. From that World Malaria Report, Nigeria has also, between 2010 and 2019, uh, also recorded the highest decline in malaria deaths, you know, by about 40%. So, which shows that some of our interventions are working, preventing deaths. And um, so, we have also uh, decreased the, the prevalence of malaria in children under five. Uh, from about uh, 42% in 2010 to 23% in 2018 from the malaria indicator service that we do nationally. And so, uh, and so that 23% is 10% by 2025. Integrated vector management and preventive strategies that include deployment of uh, insecticide treated nets or the long lasting insecticide nets to uh, true uh, distributions, what we call continuous distribution at health facilities to children under five and pregnant women, as well as through mass campaigns to states. So we do roll out, ro rolling campaigns every three years to states that are eligible for the campaigns. And, and with the support of our RBM partners, uh, particularly Global Fund, uh, P uh, President Malaria Initiative, uh, the World Bank, the, and, and other partners, UK government. So we are able to, to have this uh, rollout, mass rollout of campaigns to ensure that we, we attain universal coverage for, for at least 80% of the population by 2025. Another intervention, of course, complementing the, the net, the bed net, is the indoor residual spraying. And then uh, that, that unfortunately is not, uh, is not uh, we are not achieving optimal uh, deployment of that in Nigeria due to funding constraints. And then uh, 
uh, apart from that, we also have a uh, chemo prevention that is uh, using um, uh, uh, medications targeted at children in the Sahelia region uh, uh, to children under five using uh, sulfadoxin, pyrimetamine, amodiaquine, which in, a, in an intervention that we call seasonal malaria uh, uh, chemo prevention to children under five in uh, several states in the northern part of the country, education extended to almost 20 states in the country that, that would benefit from this intervention. It's significantly reduced, very impactful. It has been proven to be a, a very impactful intervention uh, to prevent uh, 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 morbidity, the, the you know, number of cases of malaria in those children and particularly mortality in those children. Uh, under five. Then we also have the uh, intermittent preventive treatment of malaria in pregnancy for pregnant women at the uh, antenatal care facilities. It's also uh, to ensure a safe uh, outcome, pregnancy outcome for pregnant women and their uh, child and their inf uh, unborn child. Uh, so apart from that, of course, there are also other uh, interventions for prevention that include use of um, uh, um, well, I mean, do, uh, doors, netting, uh, personal protective equipment, aerosol sprays, and all that, that uh, and instead repellents, that uh, that's not deployed uh, programmatically, but, you know, we also advocate people to use that. Then apart from these uh, uh, preventive interventions, like I said, we have a strategy that, that uh, targets, uh, you know, prompt diagnosis and treatment. And we recently reviewed our national guidelines for diagnosis and treatment. To, to promote tests, to emphasize testing before treatment for malaria, rather than presumptive treatment, like uh, the first lady mentioned, every fever is not malaria. So we are promoting people should get tested uh, using the rapid diagnosis test kits, which are deployed uh, both at community level and at health facilities, and also uh, or, or microscopy where you have the expertise uh, to, to perform a microscopy. So mostly the RDTs are deployed at primary healthcare facilities and community level uh, within the integrated uh, community case management for malaria uh, and other, the, uh, other childhood diseases like uh, diarrhea and uh, pneumonia, respiratory infections. So apart from uh, that, we, we also want to ensure that, uh, you know, uh, uh, severe malaria is treated using the recommended injection at estimate, which is the first line treatment. And then for us, we, ACT, of course, is the recommended um, uh, treatment for non-complicated malaria. So then we have these other supportive interventions, like I men mentioned, uh, behavioral change communication uh, intervention strategies, uh, mon surveillance monitoring and evaluation, and operations research. Uh, those are the key interventions that are within this uh, current strategic plan and even in the previous strategic plan. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Perpetua. It's good to see you again after so many years. Oh my God, um, it's so disheartening to hear that Nigeria records 27% of all malaria cases in the world. I was hoping that uh, Dr. Senesi would have shown us the statistics of the world's malaria cases and the, and the deaths. And then 23% of the deaths, oh my God. But I'm glad that we are slowly catching up. Um, our next speaker will probably be able to, you know, help us put this in more perspectives because it's coming from, you know, from the custodian of, um, of health. They have all the malaria data and all the statistics up to date. Um, he is Dr. Peter Ulumese. He's also a clinic, uh, clinician and uh, over, over 15 years experience in, Niger in Africa before he moved to WHO to join the Global Malaria Program. He's responsible for you know, the updating the uh, WHO guidelines for the treatment of malaria. He's, you know, he's the right person, the technical support to regional, sub regional and national anti-malaria treatments. He's also the co-chairman for the country and regional support partners. So I think he has all the answers for us uh, this afternoon. You've heard, you've heard the situation in Nigeria from, from the state level and also from the national level. So um, over to you, Dr. Peter Olumese. And thank you so much for joining us this afternoon.
Yeah, thank you very much um, for inviting me to be part of this and uh, nice to see all the faces. Um, some I have not seen for a long time because we have all been COVID-fied yeah. in our various places. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's nice um, to, um, to, to be here. And um, for me, it's always a pleasure talking about malaria. That has been a major part of my life. In my previous life, was a pediatrician and clinical pharmacologist working on malaria. And since with WHO, over 20 years, now it's been malaria. So it's, it's uh, and, um, I also just want to, before I will show some slides, I want to commend Her Excellency. Um, I, I want to make one note right away. Though when you were listing the results of what you have done with your work, NGO and all of that, you were talking in terms of net distributed and so many things. But I think one very important fact, which um, you did not highlight is the fact of the, 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 the political leadership. The mere fact that this you are taking this up and the position you occupy in the states sends a very strong message that this is something that is important. That is strong political will, which eventually will translate to increased budget and so many other things. So I, I, I wanted to raise that before I forget that we should not only count in terms of the nets we distribute, the number of people we have trained, but sometimes just having key figures in the society hold that position and you always bring it on the political agenda actually goes a long way beyond the commodities that we, we, we give. So I, I commend your effort and I say congratulations. And I think the state is lucky to have you <laughs> and have you play that role at, at, at this time. So um, very briefly, I will share my screen. I would um, give a global picture of where we are with um, ma malaria and um, try to put things in context and perspective. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can. Okay. Yeah. So um, like has been said, most of what I will talk about is based on the report, the World Malaria Report of, uh, that was released in December last year and looked at malaria burden up to 2019. This, Malaria still remains a major problem. About half the world population, 3.2 billion at risk. But I think my emphasis here is that amongst the over 229 million cases of malaria uh, for 2019, 92% is in Africa. And amongst the um, over 400,000 deaths, 94% in Africa. And uh, like the first speaker said, uh, um, it remains the highest cause of death among children. Yes, we're happy that we have reduced from one death every 30 minutes to one death every two minutes, but no death is good and no death should be uh, tolerated for a disease that is largely preventable and treatable. Uh, just some figures quickly to put this in perspective. We've made some good progress, uh, but while we congratulate ourselves, we also know that we have not, we are not where we should be. If you look at the figures from the 2000 to 2019, there have been a global reduction of 29% in the case incidence of malaria. Uh, however, you would notice that from 2015, there was a slowdown and if anything, an initial increase in the number of cases. And so we are completely off target. We would have expected things to come down this way and not be this way. So we're making progress. Like um, uh, was said concerning Nigeria, cases have gone down, but we're still not where we, we we're still not where we want to be. Um, and again, putting that in perspective, um, this is 229 million cases in 2019, of which 215 were from Africa. And uh, the Nigeria program just highlighted that a short while ago, how many of these cases actually come from Nigeria. Let's also remember that Nigeria is the most populous country, uh, but um, having said that, uh, it still accounts for a great number of cases. This is for debts. We've made greater progress with reduction in debts, over 60% reduction between the 2000 and uh, currently. But again, you'll see there was a slowing down in 2015 not as bad as the cases, but there have been a slowing down. And if you look at this again from the global perspective, 
and you look at uh, Africa region, we contribute the highest number of deaths to the malaria case. So we, we, it, it's, not, it, it's not a good picture, but we're making progress. And I wanted to put this in perspective also, uh, that yes, though things have slowed down with the areas we have high body, we're also making a lot of gains when it comes to elimination. 22 countries have eliminated malaria since the year 2000. And um, even just this year, El Salvador was, was certified malaria free by WHO. The number of countries with less than 100 cases of malaria has increased from six to 26, that's less than 100 cases a year. So it just shows that it's possible. So I'm putting this, so we have a positive spin to it. Yes, things came down drastically by 2015, slowed down, but went off track. It's just to remind us that if we do the right things, we put the right investment, it's possible. And this uh, elimination agenda shows you that this, this is possible. And also to look at it from the other way around, um, if we did not put in place what we have right now, what would it have been? Because of the things that have been put in place, we have averted over 1.5 billion malaria cases from 2000. If these interventions, the bed nets, the treatments and all were not put in place, what would the trajectory have been? It would have been something completely different. Yes, though we're not happy where we are, but we also need to look at the counterfactual. What would have happened if we did not do what we're doing right now? And the same applies with, 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 with debt. And like we've all said, COVID happened. <laughs> and, then, and the reason I put this slide here was when COVID happened, we were all afraid that we're going to have a large derailment in malaria um, um, interventions and control effort. I want to say that we're happy to report that with the collective uh, effort of partners, uh, that did not play out in the way we had feared. <laughs> and um, new technical guidance were released by WH on how to deliver malaria interventions in the face of COVID. There was a strong advocacy um, when the health systems sort of shut down in most countries to allow essential services to continue. And, and, and I'll just give one example. We all know that one of the things we have been pushing for when it comes to malaria is all children or those with malaria uh, symptoms should go to a health facility as quickly as possible to be diagnosed and treated. But when COVID started, the message was, if you have symptoms, if it is not severe, stay at home. <laughs> so, and the symptoms of COVID was in a way also similar to malaria. So we had to come up with messages to, as it were, counter this to say, yes, whilst trying to prevent the spread of COVID, we must not lose sight of other more, uh, yeah, uh, diseases that are killing the, the children and women. And so, so with all of these efforts in place, uh, I, I'm pleased to say that most of the next campaign, the seasonal malaria chemical prevention campaigns and all that we have planned for 2020, we are successfully carried out amidst a bit of delay. However, putting into place extra resources to ensure that the PPEs and all were provided to keep both the health workers and the, the, the recipients uh, safe as much as possible. So COVID happened, it's still there still a challenge, but we're moving forward. I just quickly want to see what's been done globally. There's a global technical strategy, uh, which is a 15 year strategy looking at where we want to go to and where, where we are. And it was from 2016 to 2030. And uh, these were the goals to reduce the malaria mortality, malaria case incidents, eliminate malaria and prevent re-establishment. I think one of the key points here, which I want to highlight is, one that all countries was agreed could accelerate efforts towards elimination. So it doesn't matter where you are, it's a continuum. When we have the right things in place, everyone playing a part, we can accelerate uh, efforts towards elimination. Country ownership and leadership, I just attested to that when I was speaking about what Her Excellency is doing. It has to be owned by the countries and they have to be multi-sectoral approach. Malaria is more than a health, Ministry of Health issue. 
I'm so happy when she gave the example of setting up school clubs. So ways of getting to the community, the civil societies, everyone has a role to play when it comes to, to, to malaria. Um, improved surveillance, equity and access to services, and innovations in tools are implemented. So all of these were things that were in the package um, that we uh, had put in place globally to ensure that we reach the goals that uh, targets that we plan for 2030. Unfortunately, when you look at the first milestones for the first five years, 2016 to 2020, we were a, we were a bit off target. <laughs> we wanted to reduce by 40%. We only achieved 18% uh, uh, reduction, 22% off track. And you remember I said that things were coming down until 2015 wanted to reduce uh, mortality by 40%. We only achieved 3%, 37% of track. In the elimination bit, we are doing very well. Uh, but, but one good thing is that because we have goals, we have targets, there are things we can measure ourselves against and things that would help to say, are we on track? What do we need to do differently to get us back on track? And part of the ways of getting back on track was why the high burden to high impact uh, approach, where the 10, highest burden countries, the 10 countries contributing almost 80% of malaria cases globally were targeted. And um, Nigeria was one of those countries. It was put up, started in 2018 by WHO and the European Partnership. And the whole goal was to get us back on track by reducing mortality and mobility and you know, using reinforcing what we are doing in a better way, political will. You know, um, like someone said, it took us how long to get the COVID vaccine? We've been struggling with the malaria vaccine forever. <laughs> um, when it comes to HIV, before uh, not too long ago, it was difficult to find civil societies engaged in malaria. It was, you know, so we needed to bring this back on the table, political will, country ownership. But that is what we translate to budget allocation and what we translate to you know, things that we do. So it has to be owned and strategic information. We needed information to know what to deliver, where to deliver, are we making progress, not one size fits all, better guidance and coordinated response. So this was an approach that was targeting first and foremost, the 10 high burden countries. And um, uh, it's still on expanding it to other countries. And before I end, I just wanted to say something about the vaccine because uh, I'm sure people will ask questions, the malaria vaccine and you know, something on the news not long ago. But there are so many vaccine candidates, but one that has gone very far is the ROTSS, uh, which like you see, it's taken over 30 years and we are still counting because we are not there. Um, right now we are at this stage where it is being piloted. It's been shown to be, um, efficacious to a certain point. It's not as high as what we would expect, but it certainly uh, adds as one of the tools available. However, there were certain things to learn, how best to deploy it. Um, if you want to deploy it as part of the EPI program, that would allow you to give three doses as part of the EPI program. But there's a dose that is required at an eight older age group outside the EPI program for it to be very effective, the fourth dose. And we needed to learn how do you operationalize this at country level to get the fourth dose, but without the fourth dose, you won't get it. So that's what is happening now in three countries, Ghana, Kenya, and Malawi. Uh, so they're looking at feasibility of reaching children with four doses administered outside of the usual EPI schedule, which is additional operational measures required. Um, more safety issues to look at, impact on routine use, and the data uh, from this would help WHO make uh, a, a more robust recommendation as to what to do with the vaccine. As of now, uh, you, you will have over 600,000 children who have received at least one dose of this vaccine with more than 1.7 million vaccine doses administered uh, as part of operational studies in these three countries I referred to. In terms of timeline, we're hoping that results from those studies would later on this year um, be available for a recommendation to be made as how best to roll this forward 
uh, in terms of reaching uh, uh, of making vaccine, this arrow TSS vaccine as one of the tools uh, for, for, for malaria control. Um, but good to know that we're not just depending on this. Like most of you would have seen in the news not long ago, a group in the UK have come up with another potential vaccine candidate with a higher efficacy. They're just about now to go into larger studies to see how, uh, how if these results can be reproduced in larger studies and things. So work is ongoing, more tools are being looked into, uh, more uh, better insecticides are being looked into. We're looking at new drugs and looking at new ways to deliver to act so that we get back on track and hopefully get to the goals that we have set for uh, 2030. So in conclusion, I would always start with country ownership and leadership. The only way you sustain things is to own it. We've done, we've had a lot of projects, 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 projects. We need to move from projects to programs. <laughs> projects would always work, but programs do not necessarily work. And that's where the ownership comes in. And that's where I'll comment what is happening in Cross River State. That's a demonstration of ownership. And it remains, it's entrenched. It, it, leave, it outlives those who started it. And much progress has been made, more people sleep under the net, more women receive, pregnant women receive preventive treatment. The milestones for elimination is being met. We are not where we should be in terms of disease burden and deaths. But however, experience has shown that real robust financing, both foreign and national resources, we, we need to increase national funding. We need to get the private sector into malaria or health funding. They don't, they don't know these things. I'm happy that in Nigeria we say uh, Dangote is the malaria ambassador. Hey, we have to find ways to translate that into Naira and dollars. <laughs> but of course, it means engaging and working with them and things like that. Um, multi-sectoral approach, I cannot but emphasize this. Everyone has a role to play. And that's why I like that logo that uh, 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 zero malaria starts with me. Everybody has a role to play. Every part of the society, the community, we need to start from bottom up. They need to own it. And that's beyond ministries of health, ministry of agriculture, ministry uh, of, 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 of uh, finance. So this is all important. And also funding from both domestic and traditional resources must increase for us to sustain the goals we have achieved. So I think I will stop at that end. I hope I have not gone too long the time I was given. So thank you very much, but let's continue to keep our eyes on the prize, a world free of malaria. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Olumese. I quite enjoyed it. I didn't even uh, see the time going. I just wanted to clarify something. Um, so the vaccine is ready for deployment. The ROTSS vaccine have received, in terms of registration, has received a positive endorsement from the European Medical uh, Regulatory Authorities. And uh, WHO has approved the WHO and Gavi approved it um, for large phase four studies. Like I said, we need to understand. You see, if it were just within the EPI program, then that's easy. You already have a platform for delivering it. Mm -hmm. But without the fourth dose, which is given at the age of two years plus, mm -hmm. you are not going to have the maximum effect of that vaccine. So that means we need to develop a strategy of delivering that fourth dose. And that's part of what is being tried out in these three countries. Um, and they're doing it as part of, most of the countries see it as phased implementation. So the answer to your question is yes, but still being deployed under controlled condition because we are learning more in terms of how best to deploy it. Okay, I'm still going to ask some questions because I- No problem. <laughs> so the fourth dose, when, because initially when you said older population, I thought this was like from 12 years old to 13, but we, we did have the hepatitis C that was also introduced at a much later age after everybody had been vaccinated. And then, because initially it wasn't part of the EPI, isn't it? And then later on it was added. And, and in some countries, I don't think it's even a compulsory um, 
vaccine yet. So how come we can't do the malaria first dose like that? Well, I'm not saying we can't do it like that. That's what we are learning. That's what we're trying to see how best to do because to be given 18 months after the third dose. So it's not, we cannot. So you, you needed to set up a new system to deliver the hepatitis you, you, you're referring to. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, so that is, so it's, it's more of a deployment and operation, operational research. And I just want to add here that um, um, fortunately we have a vaccine, but unfortunately um, it's not as if if we begin to use the current vaccine we have right now, it replaces any of the interventions we have. Uh, because uh, at best, the efficacy is almost the same as what a bed net would give. So it's, it's, it's a tool addition to it. And we talk about the mm -hmm. efficacy of 30% for a number of years. So it is a bit, so it's not, it's in the true sense of it's not a true vaccine the way, we, that's the best way I put it. Okay. But that's the best we have right now, but good enough that we have a lot of candidates in the pipeline that may do better. And if we already learn how to deploy it now, then that will be easier when others come in on board. Okay. Thank you so much for clarifying that. We'll come back with more questions, but for now, we need to move on to our next speaker. Uh, before then, let me mention the political will. Um, I'm sure all the state governments and you know governments of different countries are, are you know doing whatever they can. I don't know how much um, more they need to do, but I hope you'll be able to throw more light on that for us later on, from your perspective as WHO and from your experience as a clinician. You know what governments need to do more, you know, to own this program. Um, at this junction, I would like to call on somebody else. Let me break the Nigerian circle, and then I bring in somebody from Cameroon. Um, she has experience, civil society, uh, civil society coalition experience, so she'll be able to speak from that perspective, and also from the perspective of her own um, organization. Uh, Ms. Olivia, Olivier Ngu, is the um, executive director of civil society for malaria elimination. This is a global network of civil society organizations dedicated to ensuring that communities are at the center of efforts to eliminate uh, malaria. We've heard a lot that you know all stakeholders need to be on board. It's a multi-sectoral approach to eliminating um, Valeria, I've not heard so much about what individuals need to do, so I hope that will still come up in the discussion today. Um, Olivia's effort, Olivia's efforts to increase political will and domestic resources in the fight against malaria have helped result in Cameroon increasing its domestic funding to malaria by over 400 percent in recent years. Olivia, we would love to hear more about this and what you are doing. Thank you so much for agreeing to join us this afternoon. Over to you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be um, speaking at this webinar and thank you for the invitation. And I would like to also join Dr. Peter to congratulate um, her excellency for her political engagement in, um, in Nigeria because it's very amazing to see political leaders implementing malaria program and also congratulate Dr. Perpetua uh, for all the work that, that she has done, especially also leading the Malaria Matchbox, which is a tool to assess gender integration in, in malaria program in Nigeria. So my name is Olivia. I'm the Executive Director of Impact South Africa, and we uh, coordinate the first global civil society uh, organization that are that are actually focusing on malaria elimination, particularly advocacy and community engagement, because we realize that malaria is still one of the first cause of mortality, especially in Africa, but um, we needed to have more voices to advocate for the elimination of malaria, which means increase of, of uh, resources, but also um, integrate communities and the role that they play. So our, with, with, with our national platform, our missions, our global platform, our mission is uh, to contribute to a malaria-free world by 2030. Uh, but most importantly, we want to make malaria programs and, and interventions 
more effective, sustainable, equitable, innovative, inclusive of civil society, community-based, human rights-based, gender-sensitive, and adequately funded. So what we do is first we connect civil society organization and communities affected by malaria into a single platform. And we also um, conduct a lot of uh, capacity building activities on malaria, on advocacy and community engagement, on gender program, et cetera, et cetera. We also encourage strong collaboration with uh, national malaria control programs in countries. And we um, advocate for sufficient and sustained resources to be able to reach malaria elimination and also the promotion of uh, access to effective tools for malaria, such as mosquito neck, ensuring that we leave no one behind in the net distribution, but we also have a strong focus on the usage of those nets for communities, even living in rural, uh, in, in rural and remote areas. And we also advocate and demand the innovations like uh, such as the malaria vaccine presented by Dr. Peter um, to make sure that those vaccines um, can actually reach, can actually be the, developed quickly and can reach communities so we can have better chance to eliminate the, the disease. And so we are, um, uh, so the network is based in Cameroon, but we have over, 347 members in 43 countries. And of course, Nigeria is a key country because of the malaria burden. And we are very um, happy because for the first time we have the CSOs working in malaria in Algeria who are talking regularly with organizations in, in Cameroon, in GRC, even in Southeast Asia as well, uh, working on malaria, exchanging best practices and strategizing on um, what's the best way to to increase community engagement. So I would like to also quickly talk about the topic of um, women, particularly uh, women in the field of malaria. Uh, we know it's very important to have uh, women in the age of malaria because first of all, uh, the women and children pay the highest price when it comes to malaria death and the burden of malaria. And so it's very critical that they are involved in the response uh, to eliminate the disease. And we also know that women play a critical role, role in the house and where they are often the first uh, caregivers and the first one to, to try to diagnose and, and then also try to go administ administer treatment formally for the husband, for the children, for the whole family. So they are really at the center of the malaria response and the first things that community do when they have a fever. So it's very important that women are engaged in malaria elimination. And we think that they should be engaged at different levels. So uh, first at the small strategic level and the decision-making level, um, what we would like to see is more women being engaged. And we are happy to have Dr. Pekecha at a very national strategic level um, and to have more women engage at that level where decisions are being made around the strategies of malaria in the country, because it's very key to ensure, to ensure that when those, those decisions are being made, um, issues and um, concerning women and, women and children and gender issues are being taken into account. Um, just, just to give a quick example, so I, uh, if if uh, the country plans to deploy com community health workers to test and treat malaria at the community level, it's very important that um, at the, at the decision-making level and you know, strategy level, we ensure that um, some women are part of the community health workers uh, to be able to access um, some women living in their houses who, who will probably not be comfortable with the male community health workers. So if we miss that from the beginning, um, at the ground level, we might actually find a lot of barriers and challenges uh, with those community health workers not being able to enter a women's house uh, because of social issues. So women at the strategic level is very key. Uh, we need more women in uh, making, having the power to decide on the strategy because they know the issues very well. And we also need more women of course, at the operational and management level, uh, in the domain of science, of research, 
in NGOs leading the fight on the ground, uh, also with the healthcare workers, staff uh, who are at the forefront of the malaria response. And of course, at the community level, with community health workers, um, community-based organizations, uh, making sure that women's organizations and associations are involved in the, in the response, because we will have very, very good results when we, when we include those women's organizations to sensitize communities and populations. Um, and then at the, the last level, which is at home, uh, it's very important to empower and sensitize women uh, who are uh, the child um, caregivers and who also are actually at the center of the house. It's important that they are sensitized partic particularly. And uh, so, so that's what is, is very critical to make sure that uh, we have in our countries malaria programs that are really gender transformative and that really includes all the needs of the women in all their diversity and all their contexts to make sure we can reach um, elimination quickly. And we do believe that eliminating malaria will necessarily come um, with the strong community engagement and strong community empowerment. Um, communities and populations who have really um, a strong role to play. We want to eliminate malaria and, and they should do so communities should be at the center of the response and should be empowered. Like we have seen for COVID-19, how communities in Africa have um, developed their own mechanism to reduce the pandemic, um, um, producing their own masks, um, finding their own solutions to, to prevent the pandemic, and sensitizing even their own community at their own cost. So it's very important that we do the same for malaria. We really empower them to take ownership and uh, to increase ownership and to be able to, to own the disease. We think the elimination really comes when we have strong community engagement in the fight. So quickly, um, challenges. We have a, a lot of challenges in the inclusion of women and, and also communities, malaria elimination, one of the most obvious challenge is the financial barriers. Uh, many civil community organizations or civil society organizations don't have enough support and resources to be able to roll out the full plan and to be able to develop their full um, um, programs for malaria. So they do need more support at the community level. And also um, there's also social and cultural uh, religious barrier who, who can also be a challenge in the involvement of women. And there's also all, all of the lack of participation of women, in, uh, of more women in those decision-making spaces, which um, is also a challenge or any barrier. But we think that all those challenges can really be overcome because at the end of the day, um, we, the people, uh, make decisions. And, 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 and if, as a malaria community, we decide to improve and to change, um, we believe that the changes will happen very quickly um, to ensure that we have now malaria programs that are very inclusive of uh, gender representation and also address barriers that we can face. Um, for example, if you have an issue if the system, the healthcare center, give a mosquito net free of charge to a pregnant woman so that she can be protected from malaria, uh, if she goes home and her husband say, I do not want to sleep under this net, I don't want the mosquito net on our, uh, I don't want you to, to install this net in our bed, she's most likely to, to not use the use the net because she faced that barrier in her in, in, in her house. So it doesn't matter how many, the number of net that we will, we will give her if we really don't address all the other social issues around the way she lives, she might not use that net because the husband doesn't want to don't doesn't want to use the net and doesn't understand even the importance for uh, uh, all of them to be protected. So we have to really make sure that those malaria programs uh, include uh, gender 
issues and make sure that we address them correctly. And we have to, of course, increase communication sensitization at the community level, um, including to the, the to men and to head of households. Um, this all goes with ensuring that women are consulted, are involved when malaria programs and interventions are being designed. So all those issues can be taken into account from the beginning. And finally, um, other solution, of course, is to invest more in, uh, in the communities program, in women's rituals program, um, increase also the power and, and the participation of community-based organizations in, in malaria program. And of course, also the involvement of women uh, that are political leaders and decision makers to make sure all those issues are, are taken into account. So uh, so this is, this is the message that, that I have, but we are, we are on good track and we believe that we can reach our goal and we can even um, achieve malaria elimination if we can have enough resources to be able to come up with more innovative tools like vaccines like we saw with COVID-19. If we can uh, make sure that we increase community engagement to make sure communities use their net and other tools that are available at the community level and all of that by making sure we include women and gender because they, they uh, play a key role and they will be a really catalyst catalyst for change and will help um, the, all the country and us to achieve malaria elimination. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olivia. Um, I remember somebody was asking um, about, you know, because we had included reaching zero malaria from a gender perspective. And um, somebody was like, oh, malaria affects everybody. It doesn't affect women differently. But malaria doesn't affect women differently, but it affects young girls and, young, and pregnant women differently. Also in terms of the health seeking, um, health uh, treatment seeking behavior. So I'm quite glad you touched on all that. And uh, thank you for all that you're doing. Our next two speakers will be speaking from the perspective of, you know, practical strategies, you know, medicines and tools. But before we go into that, I think we need to pause for questions that, um, you know, anyone might have to put up to our previous speakers. So we would like to open the floor for questioning. I would like to invite my um, one of my co-moderators, Ms. Otunye, now. Noye, if you know for any questions from the chat room, I know she's monitoring the chat room. Yeah, I, I was wondering if we still have um, Temilola Ayelati. If yeah, she's still here. yeah. Are you I, here, Temilola? Um, yes, I'm here. Yeah. yeah, I know you've been um, typing in some questions in the chat. Would you like to? share them now please oh yeah thank you very much good afternoon everyone um i really want to appreciate uh, all our guests uh, speakers for you know what we've had so far and um i hope that uh, there will be positive responses and changes. But basically what I want to ask, because I, I was trying to ask a question, not even one, I have like over 10 questions, but uh, what I want to say is, uh, you know, using Nigeria as a case study, because that is where we have the higher rate of malaria. And um, I think, the problem is not just the malaria, but the, what are the factors contributing to this? Because there is no way we, we, we can, okay, like treat malaria and all that, but if we don't address the factors affecting that, there is no how we can get to the zero level. And what are those factors? We have the environmental factors itself, you know, and we also have uh, other factors like uh, uh, bad town planning, in, uh, inadequate uh, power supply, because I'm sure some people may be wondering what has power supply got to do with malaria? It's 
sure has a lot to do with malaria because considering the weather of that country, you know, one, once there is no light, people, you see people, you know, taking fresh air in front of their houses or at the backyard, and they are being beaten by mosquitoes and all that. And then there are some people that they have bushes around their, their houses, and you know, they, 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 they are being beaten by mosquitoes. Then what about the healthcare system itself? You see, people go, they go to the hospital, and at the end of the day, they are not being treated just because they don't have the money to pay for tests, because you know, they, it's not possible for a, uh, a physician to, to just tell the patient, okay, go and treat malaria without carrying out tests. And in this situation, most people, they find it difficult to even have a square or two square means, not to talk of carrying out the test. And at the end of the day, they ended up getting drugs over the counter. And again, there is still another problem in that aspect. And this is the main thing I would like to address because people, they, they go to different places, chemists, pharmacies, and then they get drugs, but they don't even know where and how those drugs are being um, produced because being a nurse, I before I left Nigeria, I had the pharmacy and there was a situation whereby some of these uh, drug dealers, you know, they came to me and they told me, you know what, if you want to make your money, there are places you can go to get your drugs. And then I asked them where they mentioned a particular state. And I was like, it is not possible. I'd rather go to the known pharmacy, you know, the pharmacies that I know that I cannot go to such places because I discovered that those drugs were fake. And that is when, you know, people will start comparing, oh, in the pharmacy, they, stay, they sell this for 100 naira. In the pharmacy, why is it 300 naira? So my question is, how do we create awareness for the people that once it comes to malaria treatment, you don't have to look at the money, but look at the quality um, care you are getting. And again, I will take us to another, <laughs> I'm sorry for taking our time. I will take us to another challenge that has to do, that has to do with that. And that is following the, um, the, 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 the five, uh, the five points of our, you know, the right dose, the right time of taking the, the medications, the right, um, the right patient, you know, and so on and so forth. So how do we get to the, um, to the, to the depth of the problems affecting the total elimination of malaria in Africa as a whole. And again, lastly, our government has a whole lot to do about this because I have been to national hospital. I have been to some teaching hospitals in Nigeria. And at a point, I challenged uh, a, a, a state NO on duty. I looked at uh, the, the, the ward and I said, Madam, why are the best spreads like this? Because I saw blood stains on some uh, linens and I asked her, why are they looking dirty? You know, she looked at me and said, where are you from? Who are you? I said, I don't have to be somebody before telling you the right thing to do. And then she made mention of something. She said, what do you expect us to do when we are supposed to have over 20 nurses on duty and we have just only three attending to patients and there you see our nurses cleaning the um the rooms and then when patients are made to take their medications at the right time they ended up taking it before the time or after the applicable time thank you very much uh -huh. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Madam Temilala. I did see your your questions in the chat, and I felt, oops, I hope I remember her name. But thank you. I would like okay. to um, ask Dr. Peter Lumese to kindly respond to Madam Temilala. I like. 
Okay, thank you. I'll be very brief because of time. I, I, yeah. I think all the points you have raised, they are valid. And um, I will just sum that up by saying that's why we say malaria, and indeed, most of this, where well, we're talking about malaria now, it's not just a Ministry of Health disease, it's multi-sectoral. Every part has a role to play. And um, what you've just listed are different aspects and different roles that are being played. Um, the, Her Excellency told us about the school group. That's one way of sending advocacy messages. If those children take the right messages home, things will change in those homes and do things will change in their community. So every part has a role to play. Civil society, everyone has a role to play. And those factors you listed are important factors. Urbanization is all part. I'll just give an example. You know, there, there are some parts of, um, yeah, we're talking about Nigeria and other countries where you have a savanna kind of environment. So you have a rainy season and then a dry season. And so malaria transmission is more during the rainy season. So if now, because I want to feed the nation, I go to set up irrigation schemes <laughs> in those places, I have just transformed a transmission season of six months to all year round. So it's, you just, you, you, the, the agri ministry, uh, ministry is trying to do something to improve things. So we need to look at it from the whole perspective. And I think the, the, the director has spoken to that, everyone has spoken to that. So all I will say now is that your points are valid and they are all things that form the package of reaching our end goal. That's why I say zero malaria starts with me, everybody, the pharmacist, the driver, everybody has a role to play in getting us to zero malaria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Peter Lumese. Uh, we will be coming back to speak to Dr. Perpetua, but that will be after the two speakers. Yes, yeah, so a reminder, please. Uh, Bisi, kindly unmute yourself. Thank you. I think Dr. Moebi may have one or two things to add on to that in terms okay. of... Okay, no, that's fine. Dr. Perpetua, please unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Temito Kwe, for some of those issues she raised, and also Dr. Lumese for his response. I, I also agree with him that, uh, you know, some of those things are multi, multi, you know, to address those challenges, it's multi-sectoral. The Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Environment, uh, Ministry of Education, and all that, and of course, Ministry of Health. And then individual level, at the community level, people have to take personal uh, uh, you know, steps to keep their environment uh, uh, safe from, uh, from uh, you know, as, you know, against breeding of mosquitoes, you know, through a proper environmental uh, management, you know, and also uh, the government also has to come in terms of, you know, addressing the issue of environmental management, either through, uh, you know, using, uh, different strategies for that. So it's a multi-sectoral uh, approach, but and, and like you said, zero malaria, but it starts with me, individuals must also do their part. In terms of use of LLIs, for instance, we have a big challenge on that. When we do our service, the net uh, distributed ownership is far different from the usage. And like you mentioned, some of those factors are because people tell you the LLI is too hot, when the weather is hot and then, you know, we don't want to use the net, it makes us even hotter. And so, you know, you then you say, then what can people do? So the issue of, uh, you know, how, if, there, if there was power and then they have a conditioner or fans, then they would not mind using the LLINs and all that. So we, we, we have to approach this two different ways. Political will is very important. In the program, for instance, we are now really uh, targeting that. We are trying to set up a, a, a malaria council and malaria council and using uh, uh, Alaji Dangote, who is the national malaria ambassador, to be uh, to help us to drive that, you know, setting up the end malaria council in the country. So we have also, um, you know, done a lot in the program to bring in all these different uh, groups, you know, the, the private sector, the civil society individuals using even the school uh, using school school children as change agents in terms of malaria carrying malaria messages to their families and to their communities so we work with all these people to ensure that everyone is involved in carrying out these malaria messages and in terms of some of the challenges we have also had in the program we find the non-compliance of some of the health workers to so national diagnosis and treatment guidelines you know you find that clinicians will tell you 
oh, oh, I know, you know, they treat, you know, presumptive treatment, they, whereas we emphasize emphasizing tests before treatment and the clinicians, some of them choose uh, clinicians or even her other health workers choose not to test before treatment. And then, of course, you know, issues of, uh, you know, missed opportunities, you know, of uh, ensuring that all the pregnant women who come in to antenatal care receive the IPT when they are due to receive it. And then, of course, we have issues with insecurity, which we all know about. And then the issue of uh, poor data reporting, particularly from the private sector. But we are now working, you know, with different organizations, you know, trying to to make sure that most of our people seek malaria uh, care services from the private sector, by the way. So we are, the program is also trying to work with uh, uh, so, uh, different uh, society groups that are involved in regulation, like the pharmacies council, uh, the, uh, the patent medicine vendors and all that, those groups to ensure that they are properly trained on how to carry out uh, di rapid diagnostic test kits for malaria before they treat. Although like it's an issue of poverty, it's also there people who say, I don't have money for the test. So we're also working to ensure that those who are producing these commodities are able to, to have uh, uh, those pharmacies and outlets have access to maybe a, some a low cost RDTs to be able to ensure that they are actually carrying out the test before uh, dispensing because it's a win-win situation for them. If you have low cost RDTs, you test, and then the, the, if it's positive, the patient will decline, will buy uh, your ACTs from you as well. So we are working to strengthen all those different aspects of, of, of the program to ensure that uh, everyone is involved in the fight against malaria. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much, Dr. Perpetra. Thank you. I have um, Her Excellency raising her hand. Um, could you unmute, please, madam? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, in response to um, Temilola, Semilola's questions, she put up a lot of questions. I believe that uh, Dr. Lumese has done um, um, a lot, um, has spoken on more, most of what she raised and Dr. Perpetua has put in her word also. But on the area of um, financing, because she mentioned that uh, sometimes patients do not have the money to pay to have the treatment. And like we all know, um, uh, uh, treatment, disease treatment in Nigeria is mostly out of pocket. And, but I just want to remind her, I, I had her mention that she's not in the country as we speak. She's one of those who has uh, fled away. <laughs> so I want to just let her know that um, we are working very hard to see that we have universal coverage um, um, uh, and financing, health financing. A lot is happening. We have the National Health Insurance Scheme and they're working very hard to cascade it down to the state level. And my state is one of those that um, is keen in strongly. We have made, we have a lot of um, um, plans on ground now to really kickstart it. Right now, as I speak, registration is going on and it's, uh, it excites me because that is one of the problems that um, has been a burden on, on, on all of us. And especially for me because Working in the hospitals in the past, you, you find it ha very heartbreaking when a patient walks in and you, you, you know exactly that you can help this patient, but uh, finances come in between. And mm. um, there's, there's a lot of those cases. And then we have all this high mortality. Most of it is attributable to that. So some of them, like I have realized now in, in, in this work, some of them don't even bother to come to hospitals at all because they just tell you, oh, I don't have the, the money to pay. So it excites me that um, our health insurance scheme is, is, is on its way now. This, the plans are very solid on ground and um, that is going to help a lot of people. It's just for you to spend a thousand naira a month. If you pay in a thousand naira a month, it covers yourself and your entire household for if whatever, um, ailments or whatever comes up health-wise, you are, you can just walk into a facility and you are sure to get um, um, treatment and you don't need to bother about what is in your pocket at that time. It's, I think it's one of the best things that can happen. And I'm happy to also say that a lot of states are keen in and they are, they are, they are, some have already started and they are doing well. So it excites me to know that there's progress. Like Dr. Lumese said, 
there, there's progress. It, it, it could be slow, but we are making progress and we are happy to be a part of that progress story. So thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. That was fantastic. A real good wrap up there. Thank you. Very much appreciated. I'm going to now hand over to Dr. Bisia Debayo to introduce the next speaker. Once again, thank you very much, everyone. Yes, thank you so much, everybody, for the contribution. Um, you know, we said this is from a gender perspective, and women bear the burden of care when it comes to malaria, uh, treatment of any disease within the homestead. Um, our next speaker has you know, developed, designed and developed a device that, um, that takes away the problem of using mosquito nets. I am one of the people who cannot sleep under mosquito nets. In fact, I've even gone, I've graduated for that now to not even taking anti-malaria. <laughs> so I can understand when, you know, people put up resistance to some of these things. So I would like to call on um, Dr. Tom Collars. He's a professor at the University of uh, Liberty. He's going to talk about that special device, that special flower that he has. And I feel every home should have that. He will also be able to tell us how effective it is. Although he's talking from the perspective of a camp, a refugee camp, but I know for a fact that this can be used within the cities he will, be, he will be able to tell us, you know, how to make that possible. Thank you so much, Dr. Kolas, for joining us this afternoon. Over to you. Tom, I saw him. Please unmute yourself. I am now unmuted. <laughs> that doesn't happen often. <laughs> okay, Let's see, there we go. I'm gonna talk a little bit about reducing malaria vectors in refugee camps, but vector control is vector control, but refugee camps have uh, particular challenges, but a lot of these can be taken to smaller communities and low income communities as well. So that's, this here is the device that, one of the devices I developed called the Provector Flower. Mosquitoes see the colors, they fly to it, they eat the bait from the center, they fly away and die in three to seven days. They land in the water, they kill the larvae mosquitoes. We'll get into that a little bit in a moment. Okay, emergency management planning, reducing risk of malaria in refugee camps. One of the most important things in emergency management is to have communication between the different groups that are affected. So we want the public health officials of vector control resources and refugees as well as the government and funding agencies to be there to assist. In risk assessment and response, we want to incorporate public health and integrated vector management. And I won't go through every one of those. You can read them yourselves. But um, one of the important things is that insecticide treated bed nets are effective, but sometimes in refugee camps, they're not effective because of the small tent size and mud floors. They get dirty and they stuck, they lose efficacy, they're washed a lot. So things can, that can complicate things. So sometimes insect residual sprays are used, insect treated plastic sheets. And uh, one of the things I'm gonna get into in a little bit is the Provector technology in a simulated refugee camp. So uh, we wanna educate and communicate with refugees in local populations. There's been studies done and the way women and men look at vector control, and it's already been addressed earlier, is often different. And people are affected differently. Increasing pesticide resistance is a major challenge to vector control programs in refugee camps, as well as the rest of the world where vector-borne diseases are found. So the pyrethroids and things like that that are used on bed nets are losing efficacy. And so that's a, a huge challenge. And that may be one of the reasons that the um, reduction of malaria is not going down as quickly as we would like to. And we want to ensure accessibility to all refugees. It's a major challenge because um, women are often in charge of the health care of their families. And if they're like was discussed earlier, if by Dr. Perpetua, uh, Perpetua, sorry if I mispronounce it, um, 
I could speak Thai though. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's a major challenge. Down here, you see a map of how we can use GIS to predict where the best and identify where the best places to put the refugee camps are. That's often not done. They'll just go and they'll put a refugee camp where it's convenient for the government, but it may be putting them in a hot spot. So this is an example in Georgia of possible refugee camps and where to best set it, set it up, the low risk being in green. So that's where you would set, set it up. Emergency pl management planning, identifying risk in human population, age and gender. Displaced persons are often at higher risk of malaria, often including bed net distribution. It's not done the same way a refugee camp is, it is in the local community surrounding it. So that, that's a fact that needs to be taken into effect. Into account, sorry. Accessibility to bed nets is lower for women and children with low income and is, um, is further complicated by displacement. Children in refugee camps are often at higher risk over children in neighboring villages. Outdoor activity and sleeping behavior can increase risk of malaria. So men and boys playing outside, children playing outside, or the women working outside. And you know, uh, I've been to Africa, I think eight times. I think I've been to 40 countries around the world. And you know, different, different people have different cultures and we do things differently like was addressed earlier. A lot of families in low income communities countries don't have air conditioning that's a you know that's a major major issue and another thing that needs to be taken into account is the genetics of people and the genetics of the plasmodium the malaria strain so if you're co-infected with csp 26 to csp 29 it affects your immune system your host response and i did a study in thailand on this and different Genotypes, HLA types of people were affected differently with co-infection. There's a significant difference. So vector control using the Provector pesticide system. Provector uses colors and bait to attract a mosquito into feeding on the bait. Um, it uses BTI. I was the first one to really develop um, technology that could be commercialized. They use BTI to kill, kill adult mosquitoes. It's been used for over 60 years to kill larvae mosquitoes, but I was able to adapt it so that it kills the adult mosquitoes. And what's wonderful about it is the mosquitoes, adults will feed on the bait, they'll fly away in three to seven days. And when they die, they'll kill the larvae. Wonderful thing about BTI, it's non-toxic to vertebrates. It doesn't even hurt bees or butterflies. It's very target specific. And so, um, and another thing that's important with BTI is that there has been no pesticide resistance identified anywhere in the world in the wild mosquito populations for BTI. So that's, that's a very major factor. And I can, I can actually mix like a pyrethroid in with BTI and the, the pyrethroid may or may not kill the mosquito quickly, but the BTI will kill it more slowly. You know, a lot of people, hey, I wanna see dead mosquitoes on my floor. And I can understand that's why I, did, I developed that technology as well. I also can add insect growth reg regulators. And we've worked with several health departments around the United States um, testing that. And it's found, found to be very efficacious. It's environmentally friendly and it's a low cost. It costs about one ten thousandth the amount of pesticide being applied into the environment. so that makes it less costly. So there's the four main technologies. There's on the left, there's Provector Flower, and in the middle of Provector Tube. And this I call the Provector Super Netting. Um, you can take a colored piece of paper and you pop holes in the cap with a nail. The mosquitoes see the colors, they fly, eat, eat through the cap, fly away and die. And then the netting, um, this is actually from one of our Amarin visits in, in Kenya that I, that I did with Dr. Sinesi. Here's the simulated village we set up in 
refugee camp in um, Georgia. And you can see that there's a rapid reduction. We were using, uh, this is early on in the development of the technology, it had a two week bait pad in it. It would come down, it would go back up, it would come down. So that led us into um, increasing the length of efficacy. But there's a significant difference in the control of Anopheles using this technology. So then we uh, had a one month pad and we worked with the Walt Reed Army Institute of Research and the Kenya Medical Research Institute in Harawan, Alanda. And there was a significant reduction in Anopheles Kustani and Anopheles Parawansis. The, the productive flower was not put inside the home, it was put under the eave outside the door, protected from the rain and the, and the sun. And uh, the, the reason I came up with the Profactor flower, that can be used in conjunction with the IR indoor residual spray or with the bed nets or used standalone. And then the, you know, of course the mosquitoes are a lot outside too, right? And so there has to be a, a cost-effective and environmentally friendly way of controlling mosquitoes outside. And that's why I came up with the SuperNetty bottle and this and a Provector tube. This is a study we did with the Rollback Malaria Program in collaboration with the Afro-European Medical Research Network. We did surveys. We used artificial intelligence um, to estimate the number of mosquitoes that people were finding in their homes. And so pre-testing, and then you can see there's a significant reduction over the first period, and that's with the three-month pad. So we went from a two-week pad to a three-month three -month pad. And here's a, methoprene is an insect growth regulator for um, larvae. It also affects other um, insect species. And so the one thing about our product is that the mosquitoes are attracted to it. They feed on the entobac with the ETI and the methoprene. And methoprene not only affects the larvae mosquitoes, the development of them, it actually reduces the ability of female mosquitoes to produce eggs, viable eggs. So it's, it's a very good and safe product. It's non-toxic to vertebrates. And we also uh, did a study in Texas with the Houston County Health Department and found it was very efficacious there. This was done in Bullock County. And this is the um, Anopheles species. You can see the, you have the baseline. And then within three months, you have a huge increase in the, in the control, the negative control site. And you have a decrease in the test site. So in conclusion, we wanna in incorporate integrated vector management in refugee camps. So the emergency management personnel when they're setting this up need to look at a number of factors. Where are they setting it up? Have they done mosquito surveillance there? Do they have a plan for vector control? Ensure equal distribution of medical care and vector control methods across genders and age groups. For vector components can be manufactured and packaged locally to provide income to low income families. So one of, one of my goals is to enable, you can see the, the flowers here, they're made out of, in, Charles remembers this, in the very beginning, we had an expensive plastic flower and the company I was working with, they wanted to sell it for $29. Well, that's just not practical. And so I was able to reduce that down to $4. And to increase it from a two week to a one month period to all the way to three months. So this is very, very effective. And we're starting to uh, send to many countries around the world. We actually, uh, the Provector technologies have been uh, registered in certain states in the United States. It's been registered in, Nicar in Nicaragua and also in Nigeria. And one of my goals, I'm also a medical missionary and chaplain. So I, 
I also use this to help missionaries. And we put on uh, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's actually on our products in Spanish, Swahili, English, and French. And we can put it on any language that, that a missionary would like us to. And then I'm going to... I also developed this technology called Dianaudio DNR, where I can convert DNA sequences into music. I used to write songs for cancer patients and things like that. And when my wife passed away, I quit writing. But then I was a year ago, I was God let me healed me. And I've been able to do that. And so here's one I did on COVID. I'm going to work on one with Charles and we're going to try to do a concert based on malaria and vector species DNA, their genotypes, to write a concert to raise funds for folks in low-income countries. And there's, you know, one of the things we have to remember that in high-income countries, there's also very many low-income families. So we need to help everybody in the world. We need to protect everybody. That's COVID DNA, human genome, the combination into a song. So we're going to do something similar to that. We're going to do something to, similar to that for malaria so that we can raise funds for people. And I'd like to acknowledge people that helped me. You know, when you do, when you're a scientist, you have to have help. So Banny Halsey, Dr. Heidi Halsey, Jason Kohler is my oldest son, Dr. Emmanuel Clote, who is from Ghana. He's at Liberty University now. Dr. Charleston, I see, I think you know him. <laughs> and then I'd like to give a special thanks and dedication to the memory of my wife, Peggy Kohler. She passed away six years ago, but I'm thankful I'll see her again because we both have faith in Jesus. And of course, I have to add this because I had funding from uh, the U.S. government for some of these projects. The views expressed in the presentation are those of the presenter and do not reflect the official policy of the U.S. Army or the United States government. And here's some children that we helped in, in Haiti. Um, you know, they have dengue virus and have some malaria there as well. And these precious children dressed themselves up like little pro vector flowers to thank me. It was, it was very, very sweet, very precious. Thank you so much for the invitation, Dr. Adebayo. Thank you so much, Tom, for, for that uh, presentation. And I'm very glad that um, we have you know, devices like this to help us reduce uh, the incidence and burden of treatment of malaria. Um, may your, Peggy's soul continue to rest in peace. I'm glad that um, I met her. And we were actually planning, you know, to, to go into Nigeria with the ProVector. Um, we'll now move on from controlling malaria from the outside, external, and now go on to what we do with our bodies, you know, um, the medicines we take. And I'd like to bring on board um, Abena, who is a program officer with a program manager with medicines for malaria venture based here in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, she's part of the advocacy team and work uh, with the team that work on adolescent girls and um, ambassadors, or maybe it's adolescent girls as ambassadors. Oh yeah, adolescent girls and ambassadors. Um, she has a background in biochemistry, so she's, um, she'll tell us a lot about the formula and the molecular formulation of the medicines that we use. Abena. Thank you so much for joining us. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Bissi. Uh, thanks for the invitation. And it, it's, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, I'm privileged to have a first lady with us. I think it's great to see the work you're doing and uh, Dr. Perpetua, and of course, Dr. Lumisi and Olivia, who I work with uh, closely. Um, Dr. Perpetua, hopefully I'll be seeing you in about a few days for our SMC program. So my name is Abna Puku and I work with Medicines for Malaria Adventure, which is a product development organization. So it's actually um, an international organization that discovers, delivers, and uh, uh, gives access to medicines uh, for people who are not able to afford them. And we do that for malaria medicines. 
So today I'm actually going to talk about a group that is often not spoken about a lot in the malaria elimination agenda. Um, and those are adolescent girls. Um, and why adolescent girls? Uh, because actually malaria accounts for about 7% of the deaths in adolescent girls globally. Um, and especially for adolescent girls in sub-Saharan Africa, it's a very big issue. So malaria is uh, the second cause of death um, and cases uh, or illness in adolescent girls, especially adolescent girls, younger adolescent girls between the ages of 10 and 14. Um, the challenge is that this is not often recognized. And so what happens is that uh, most of the efforts, which are great, uh, are targeted more at children under the ages of five uh, and pregnant women, which is good. And so you see that in the data, um, what is happening is that we there's been between 2012 and 2016, which would be the year of reference I'm using because that's the year that we actually have the latest data on adolescents, which in itself is a gap. Um, you see that for children under five, there's been a, a drop in malaria mortality by about 14%. But for adolescents, you see that for a, uh, just about 4%. Um, and here I'm not advocating that, you know, we take the focus away from younger children and move it to adolescents, no. But I think we need to think broader in terms of the uh, entire elimination agenda. And what that means is that we're eliminating malaria in all groups. So children under five, adolescents, everyone. But when we see groups where malaria is stagnating, then it means that there is an issue there. Um, it's not just for adolescent girls in Africa, in, sub, uh, in Southeast Asia as well, uh, especially for younger adolescents, so 10 to 14, malaria is the eighth cause of death. So um, it shows that this is really an issue. And, Someone may ask why adolescent girls, what, what makes them special or particular uh, for malaria infection? What happens is that, as we know in many African cultures, the girls, especially the younger girls, are made to take up most of the household tasks. So they're exposed to, uh, they have to wake up early in the morning or maybe see to it that, you know, their work is done after uh, tasks, after dusk and then they're more exposed then to the bites of mosquitoes. Another thing is that um, because uh, in many countries, adolescents are neither too young nor too old. Whenever you have interventions like bed nets, we think often of you know, the youngest ones in the family or the most as rich, which would be the pregnant ones. So those in the middle tend to be left behind and oftentimes they are the adolescents. And so you see that the uh, malaria burden is actually increasing. And some studies have shown that this is actually the group that is least likely to use up bed nets, um, even in schools. So what we actually find out is that um, because of the age gap that I've just talked about, they're neither too young or too old. Many countries, an adolescent can ju can't just walk into a healthcare facility on their own and say, I want to seek treatment. They have to go, they have to do that with the consent of their parents. And actually many countries have this entrenched in policy. So there is a policy that says as a young child, you cannot go on your own. Now this gets even worse for girls when they get pregnant because uh, there's a lot of stigma attached to pregnancy, especially during the adolescent time. And generally for women and girls, the pregnancy period is a time when they are most at risk of malaria because the immune system is uh, depressed. Now for adolescents, what we see with pregnancy is that malaria infection gets even higher the younger the age of the mother and when the pregnancy is the first one. So in many developing countries, you realize that a pregnancy, the first pregnancy occurs around the age of adolescence. So each year you have about 21 million um, girls uh, between the ages of 15 and 19 uh, getting pregnant. Unfortunately, we don't have data on uh, pregnancy for 10 to 14, which is a gap in itself. So what we then uh, advocate for um, is treatment, of course, when someone has malaria, which is what uh, my organization does, we develop treatment. But the challenge is that when someone is pregnant, for pregnant women, 
um, we have two or the main uh, strains of uh, malaria parasites is falciparum and vivax. For falciparum, in the first trimester of pregnancy, they're not able to use the ACTs that Dr. Perpetua talked about. That's uh, pregnant women, it's not recommended because we don't have enough studies that talk about the safety of that uh, in the first trimester. And the problem is that because the pregnant girl is scared to go to the hospital and the pregnancy is often not showing during the first trimester, the risk is heightened. And in a country, in regions like Southeast Asia and Latin America, where you have Vivax malaria. So the, the difference between Vivax malaria and falciparum malaria is that for Vivax, if you get bitten by a mosquito today and you go into the hospital and they do the test, but you're just given a medicine that just clears the blood stage. Now, the thing with malaria is that you have the blood stage parasite, which is what shows the infection. So which is what shows your symptoms. So if you're hot, you're feverish, that's the blood stage showing up. So oftentimes when you go into a healthcare facility, you get treated for the blood stage. But with Vivax, if you get treated only for the blood stage, you keep getting sick because the liver stage, which is the second stage has not been cleared. And the problem with pregnancy is that the medicines that are recommended for clearing the liver stage and cannot be used or are not recommended at any stage in pregnancy. So whether it's the first trimester or the last one. So there's no safety of uh, medication for that. So there is real need to develop medicines um, for women of childbearing age and for pregnant women, um, and of course, girls in general. So MMV has uh, developed an initiative called MIMBA. So MIMBA in Swahili means pregnant, but for MMV is mothers in uh, malaria in mothers and babies. And so we, we're trying to uh, encourage um, clinical research uh, for women of childbearing age and pregnant women, uh, because oftentimes when uh, clinical trials take place, those groups are taken out of it for safety reasons. So how do we best develop? So that means that if you cannot develop, if you can't put them into a trial, you don't know the safety of the medicine for them. And so how do we best develop medicines then for this group? Um, now we're in a COVID situation, which uh, makes the situation even worse. Now for adolescent girls, what happened as we've all seen is that when the schools closed down, um, many of them had to stay at home. So then they had to bear even more of the burden of the work, which means they're even more exposed. And uh, just recent data from the Global Fund showed that uh, a study that was done in Ghana, Kenya, and I think um, Uganda also showed that during this time, uh, teenage pregnancies actually increased by almost 65% because of the abuse, because of the issues that these pregnant girls are going through. And as I've already said, pregnancy heightens the risk of malaria. Uh, worse is the fact that for groups that have HIV AIDS, when they have malaria and HIV AIDS together, that's even worse because uh, one disease makes the other, the, the impact of the other worse. So HIV makes the impact of malaria worse and malaria makes the impact of HIV words. And uh, for women who may be pregnant uh, during this time, uh, that they are not able to receive intermittent preventive treatment because they may be receiving HIV um, treatment. So there are lots of issues that we, we see. Um, one big area that needs to be worked on um, is the fact that there is very limited data on adult, the impact of malaria on adolescent girls, even though I just um, highlighted the burden in this group. Um, so the data that we have recently uh, on malaria morbidity and mortality is from 2016. So I entreat, of course, uh, Dr. Olumise and his team to even provide even more recent data because, uh, and also, we also don't find that the data is such that it's disaggregated from zero to one, which is the neonatal stage, and then uh, zero to five, and then from uh, five years, you have five to 14, uh, you have five to 14, and then 15 to 24. So the issue with that is that it's difficult then to identify what happens between age 10 and 19, which is the adolescent group. Even better would be if we have the data from 10 to 14 and 15 to 19, so that we're able to tell where is the highest burden of malaria coming up, 
Where are the interventions working? Where are they not working? What needs to be done? I'm really grateful to uh, the first lady for saying that, you know, they have school-based programs because what are some of the solutions that we can put in place? The school-based programs are great because they teach adolescents, both boys and girls, about the impact of malaria. We also need to ensure that uh, we have youth champions and we also empower adolescent girls, especially about the impact of malaria, especially when they're pregnant, because the last thing you want to see, especially in Africa, is that it gets worse and worse, that girls get pregnant, they don't go and seek treatment or get intermittent preventive care because they're scared, which also means that we need to equip our health systems and healthcare workers to make um, uh, the, the situations friendly as well as the communities. So, um, and lastly, coming from a medicine's perspective, we need to increase investments in the development of uh, interventions, medicines uh, for adolescent girls and also for pregnant women in general. So this is where I would uh, stop. Thank you very much, Dr. Addison. Thank you so very much, um, Abena, Dr. Abena. Um, now it's a talk of what between investing in medicines and investing in um, control, you know, because I believe we can control this thing, which is why I liked what Dr. Lume has said about, you know, individual responsibilities. Zero malaria starts with me. Um, before I go into so much, um, Dr. Senesi has a comment. He wants to make um, an intervention. Please unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Dr. Bisi and, uh, and all the presenters. I think it's been a wonderful afternoon and I doff my heart to the First Lady for her wonderful intervention and uh, allow the people to develop that sense of ownership which augurs for sustainability and also for the overarching presentation from the WHO and from my colleague Abena. And of course, I home in specifically also on Dr. Kola's presentation because I've, since I met him about uh, 12 years ago or more, um, it's been very, very encouraging to see the sort of innovation that he developed because as we see, the greater percentage of the, of the malaria burden is in low and middle income countries, especially sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, I'm yet to see any innovation that are actually outside the mosquito net, the insected kitted mosquito net, in, in, in residual spring. There's never been an innovation to actually tackle the issue of the malaria. And of course, we have the culture that once you burn the, the back of the orange or something, the so they are trying. But I challenge the innovators, my colleagues, researchers. And that's why I told WHO for the past donkey years, we have never had um, a real innovation in the area of mosquito control. And so what Dr. Tolas, Tolas is using is very, very, very much welcome. I followed with him in Sierra Leone, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Kenya, extensive work with him in Zambia. We've, we've, we've tried it, it's really worked. I have lots of video, YouTube on it. And uh, it's really, really encouraging that um, such innovations with no environmental damage should be encouraged and then and scale up. It's unfortunate the, the corona has really put a, put a bit of a stop on our, on our work in low and middle income country. But be rest assured, Dr. Kola, as soon as the situation eases up, we are going to roll this out because it's one of the greatest innovations that um, I'm, I'm, I'm keep following that using this, this uh, insecticide uh, or this chemical, which is totally inert to human, you know, can actually kill the mosquitoes by just tangling their stomach. And it's a very wonderful mechanism. So I think um, there's a lot of room for improvement. I will continue to work with the WHO again on the rollback malaria when I was a board member there to encourage some innovations and uh, see how we push it forward. And then, uh, so with that, I think, um, I, I will leave the others to comment on it, but I will also further challenge our colleagues that um, to actually join the wagon of this vector, or we have other innovations that are environmental friendly and at the same time sustainable and easy to implement. So um, there are lots of publications which are already done, and, and I thank everybody. We need to put extra resources in the area of malaria treatment. When I go to Africa, I don't walk on the mosquito nets in the night and when I'm outside on the, around the house, as Dr. Bissi said. So we have to have other things out of the box and encourage this environmental friendly and inert innovations like Provector and all the allied products. I thank you. 
Thank you so much, um, Dr. Senesi. Um, you know, everybody has been commending the first lady. I, I, I just want to bring up something I read about what the governor himself is doing. He's, he's very passionate about uh, maternal and child health and on several occasions has called for interventions in, in, in correcting this this small trend in maternal and child deaths in the states. So Excellency, please pass on our commendations to His Excellency. We appreciate what he's doing. But how do we replicate this and make this go through the entire country? You know, I know there is a governor's forum. I know there is also first uh, forum for the governor's wives. Is this something that you discuss there? Is malaria on the table, on the discussion table? What, what, what is happening at that level? Um, well, I can only talk for the governor's wife's forum <laughs> because I've never been to the governor's <laughs> forum. Because <laughs> there, uh, but for the governor's wife's forum, yes. Um, the, thing is, the thing is people want to express themselves according to their own passion and their interest, and I think also um, the peculiarity of the problems in their, in their different states. So um, what we do is that for those of us who have um, similar interests, we kind of come together to pursue those um, interests collectively. So um, um, unfortunately, we don't have any in malaria presently, uh, but Recently, in the last meeting or in the last kind of meeting we had, um, we had the representatives from the UNHCR who uh, my foundation works with, and they were trying to um, talk to my colleagues. They had asked me to talk to speak on their behalf before now, but they, they now had the opportunity to speak with them themselves, and um, we're beginning to look at malaria as well. There are other things we do collectively, like I said, in different sections, um, like the female mutilation and uh, um, women's violation group. We have those ones. We have the cancer group, and we have a few other smaller groups. Uh, but in terms of malaria, I found out I found that I was alone um, at, at some point, but now I think some other ones are trying to come in, and UNHCR is trying to champion us by putting our heads together to do a collective thing. And I believe in, um, in, in, in collective efforts because it yields us more than if you are doing it individually. For, but for the governor's forum, like I said, I really don't know if they, they come to that level or I don't know what they really talk about when they gather. <laughs> so I wouldn't, but maybe I would, I would try to ask my husband now that you have put the question to me. I'll try to ask him, and then I will chip this in if maybe um, um, if they can if they discuss issues like that um, to be able to help um, other states. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. And please carry our good wishes back to both of them, both groups. We hope that uh, the Governor's Wife Forum will be able to pick this up as a joint project. Maybe Dr. Papetra will be able to answer, put something on that, you know, um, you know, the governors, are they, is there any particular strategy for all the governors to yeah. embark on malaria program or this is only- No, actually, yes. Thank you very much. I also want to join in uh, congratulating the first lady of Consular State on what she's doing. And I can assure that uh, our program will engage more with her. Yes, so NMEP has been engaging with the Governor's Forum Secretariat uh, to, to, as part of uh, you know, uh, encouraging uh, political will at the sub-national level. So far, we have uh, had two meetings last, last year with the Secretariat of the, of the Governor's Forum. And we have also, uh, they, they requested us uh, for some key malaria indicators for each state for them to present that will be presented during the governor's forum so that states can be abreast with what is happening at their state in terms of malaria uh, uh, program implementation you know in terms of data that that are being uh, that is available both at the national database and also uh, other state related data on malaria 
documentation, the malaria burden and the cases, uh, deaths and other things in terms of usage of nets and other key indicators that the program tracks. So we are working with the governor's forum secretariat. We have provided them with some key uh, performance indicators for their states, which will be presented when they have their meetings. And so we are going for that to, to engage them to, so that they can uh, put more funding into malaria program at their state level and also at the local government level because we have we realized that you know national cannot do it alone also partners cannot do it alone the funding coming from partners doesn't cover all the states so there are still gaps so we we, we also uh, want the, the governors to be aware of this and know their status in terms of where they are in terms of malaria burden and death and so that they can also uh, allocate more funds their budget annual budgetary allocation to malaria yes we are working on that okay. at, the, at the national program thank you so much dr lumens i'm back on you data <laughs> abena mentioned the issue of data and who being the global you know the custodian of health you know the, the umbrella body is there anything that um you want to add to that Especially sex disaggregated data, you know. I know yeah. that's something not. Um... Okay, I, I think number one, um, I will start from saying that we essentially consider data very important. And that's why in my presentation, though I went over it very quickly, in the um, global technical strategies, um, surveillance was pulled out as something that should be considered a core intervention. So it's not an intervention, but it should be considered put at the same level, the way you put vector control, case management, and all of that, because surveillance is key. That's one way we know what we are doing, what we, we know what we should do, we know whether we're ever making any progress, we get a lot of funding, how do we ensure, you know, so uh, it's so key and important. Unfortunately, this is one of the weakest link in most countries. And if you look over the, the, the years, uh, proposals and funding from uh, bodies, one of the areas that is least, uh, where you have the least expenditure is in surveillance. So yes, WHO is actively working with countries to strengthen this. And um, also when I talked about the um, high body to high impact HBHI, you saw the strategic use of information again emphasizing the need for surveillance. Now to the specific question that you asked in terms of disaggregating data. Um, over the years, of course, we're working with countries because um, you know when it comes to malaria treatment, it, it's one of those things in areas of high malaria transmission countries. Uh, you can almost use it as an indicator for monitoring your health systems. Because <laughs> one of the leading reasons why people go to facilities, children and all, of course, fever, malaria, and things like that. And um, over the years, it, they have not been disaggregation of data based on gender. And the, the, the question has been, this has come up over and over and over and over and things like that. And really, it's important, but we don't just want to add it to an additional body so to say, if it is not data that would have a usefulness. Up until now, in most of the countries in high transmission, they, they tend to disaggregate by age, children under five, but that's a high risk population. Uh, you have data for others, children over five, uh, above five, pregnant women, you have data from the, uh, so, so yes, uh, uh, gender is important. Um, but unlike things like um, um, HIV, even TB, we don't have a lot of stigmatization with malaria. Um, um, access to malaria treatment is more of a reflection of access to the health systems or health uh, facilities. So when we talk about cross-border, for example, that's another example I want to use because even in the issue of um, gender disintegration, it's not only women in areas of um, some part of Southeast Asia where the malaria is among the male migrant workers. 
-hmm. So that's also, it also has to do with gender. Yeah. Um, I want to the example of cross-border. The challenge usually is not malaria specific, but the fact that people cannot access the health services. Yeah. So, and I think we should look at it in that holistic perspective. But the point is, yes, we're working with countries uh, because this will require changing uh, or, or, or making changes to their data collection system across board. And the question is, what do we make of the data today of desegregating children under five into male and female? It's good to know, but, and, you know, so at what cost? And at, but having said that, um, working with countries to, uh, to further disaggregate. And, and I think for us now, one of the areas of, 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 um, of, um, of interest and importance is actually realizing that when it comes to malaria, we talk about Nigeria, for example, it's not one size fits all. Even within the same state, the transmission patterns are different. The intensities are different. How, how granular can we get? Because it also affects our planning. Can we start from local government level to the state level, to the federal level? Then in that way, you are using the local government data to plan their intervention at local government level. So it's bottom up, rather, you know, so all of those are things that are ongoing, helping to further disaggregate data, uh, helping to make sure you have more granularity in data. We talk about national strategic plans. You don't just want to plan, have a plan at national level. You want it to be bottom up and all of this fed in data. And the last thing I want to say about data before I leave, it's we also need to change our perception and begin to see data as something that should be used, not just reported. When you go to most of the health facilities, when you go to most of the even local government um, health um, it's not just only health. How much of the data collected right now is used in planning? Or is it, is it just that we must have data at the end of the, uh, of the month to write reports? So even from the end user perspective, once that changes, then we begin to see the importance of data. It would actually be the end user who would be running after data. If I know that the, the, the amount of drugs coming to my facility is based on the data I have put forward in terms of how many have been treated. It will change my whole attitude of data. But right now in most settings, um, the, health work, the average health worker sees collecting data as an additional task because once he sends those data up, he doesn't get a feedback. <laughs> so it's like, I just feel it for feeling sick. So, it's important, very important, and we, 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 even with the last global fund uh, proposals that countries submitted, some are still submitting last year, this year, a lot of emphasis went on to data disaggregation. There is no, it, it, Maria is not homogeneous, there's heterogeneity, uh, it's heterogeneous. How do we capture this and have the best mix of, mix of intervention for the best for each uh, part? Uh, of the different uh, transmission uh, spectrum. Over. Sorry, spoke for too long. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, I know some programs, some countries are very emphatical about data-driven um, decision-making process. So, and for us, from the perspective of civil society, data would help us, especially the sex disaggregated data, would help us to know where to focus our advocacy efforts. Um, so please, we'll still appeal to you, even though it's an extra additional burden, especially when you there are competing um, agendas, competing use for the resources. We, no matter what, whether, you know, because when I was trying to put up this uh, panel together um, and I was looking for data for the tables, I was working with 2018 data. And somebody actually told me, oh, I'll be able to get you the most uh, recent data. And, you know, I, I didn't get that. And I was hoping that the latest report from WHO would also give us data up to 2020. Uh, but I guess COVID uh, must have also eroded that. Uh, but nonetheless, thank you so much. And um, 
I'd like to open the floor now for burning questions before we round up. I know we've gone past our time, but I'm sure you will agree with me that it's been an exciting and informative session. I personally have gained a lot and um, you know, you can't quantify these things. So I would like to open the floor for any burning questions from anybody to any member of the uh, panel. Okay. Um, I just have a question to uh, Dr. Olimbisi. I mean, so I do understand everything you've just said. It's, it's really hard to collect data in the field, but I think the question for me is if WHO is saying that you need to have targeted solutions, tailorized solutions, and yet the data is not necessarily providing um, avenues where you can actually create targeted policies, then it's, it becomes a little bit of a disconnect because you're saying that you want to provide targeted solutions, but you don't have enough data for the countries. You know, it's, it's, it's great when you say, if we have the data, people may not even use it. But the problem is if people don't have the data, they can't use it at all. So it's, you know, it's a chicken and egg, so to say. Yeah, well, I, I, um, um, I, I think I just said now, and, and, and we have evidence to that fact, that a lot of investment has gone into strengthening surveillance system and data collection in countries. Data would never be enough. You, 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 uh, but the, the point is we are not where we used to be. We're working with countries to have data repositories rather than, and, and you know, sometimes the challenge you have in countries, you may have 10 partners working in a country and they all want their data in their own way, just to answer their own question, rather than supporting the country to have a data repository from which you can pull things from. So it's, it's a work in progress. But I, the example I gave when I talked about the GTS and the HBHI, pulling it out to be considered as an intervention shows that that is the direction we're going to. The last, um, I can count countries, um, um, uh, okay, Dr. Perpetua is still around. She can tell you how data was used to drive the, the global fund uh, grant uh, in Nigeria, how data was used to determine where to implement SMC and all that. Yes, do we need more granular data? Yes. Are we where we should be? No. But have we moved significantly? Of course, we have moved significantly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, I just wanted to also just uh, sorry before you you um yeah. you, you, I just wanted to emphasize what Dr. Peter just said because uh, we in Nigeria particularly we are using a lot of data because like he mentioned for our new strategic plan we use granular data to to develop a package of 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 interventions that are tailored to peculiarities of uh, regions and states. So that's what we are rolling out now, uh, particularly like he mentioned for the seasonal malaria chemo prevention. We are using, also using a lot of data for the airline that we are deploying. We, we are doing a lot of insecticide resistant monitoring to monitor the effect of uh, the, 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 uh, the vector to the insecticide that we're using either for, for the indoor residual spraying of, of, of for the impregnated the LLI that we are, we are deploying. So before we procure LLI for any state, we use insecticide resistant monitoring data. So we are setting uh, those sites, Sentinel sites across the country where we are doing surveillance on these and only based on the data that we have before we, we procure a net. So, so that we, because there's a lot of, there's increasing resistance to the parietroids. So we want to make sure that any nets that we are deploying have are efficacious. So we are using all this data. We do yearly uh, 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 anti-malaria efficacy studies to make sure that the ACTs that we are deploying are still efficacious. So we, we are doing the surveillance on that as well every year. So we are using this data in our program implementation. I just wanted to bring that out as well. Thank you. So I think it's up to WHO now to um, standardize the kind of data that, and how they want the data to be, to be um, collected. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they, sorry, data belongs to the country. That's exactly what I have just said. Yes. And the standardization, <laughs> and I think that's where we need to start from. Data yeah, I, think, I think that's, that's a very good point, um, uh, 
my colleague from WHO. That's what I wanted to actually home in upon. Yeah. That the WHO relies a lot for my 12 years of working with them, relies a lot on the on the country. With the country, at the country level, you have to feed the WHO with the correct data. And the NGOs working in the countries, you have to come together to sort of support the government because they are the custodian of the health, just like the WHO is the custodian of the health of the world. So whatever little efforts you can do, like we, what we do as AMREN, is that we support the country offices, we support the WHO in implementing in country level, we feed back the data we bring from the country into the general system, because nobody is small to make a change. So it's very important that even at the NGO level, you can all take part in ensuring that we have quality data from the country level, from the village level, to the, to the town level, to the city level, out of the country, because every help is important, so that you have enough data upon which to stand upon. As I say, I work for the Swiss government in clinical trials regulation. We have our in-country data, which is well regulated. And it is something we Africans can also do. It's nothing out of this world to make sure that don't just fill in the questionnaires at the end of the month just to fill in the questionnaires. Think that each questionnaire you fill in has got impact. The quality of data is what we stand upon. Otherwise, it's like a house built with, with on, on sand. It cannot stand. So that's why we say every little help you do is supporting the government, supporting the, the, the WHO, supporting the international community. And that's what one of my take home message, I really like to um, implore our colleagues from the NGO sector, from the private sector, so that it comes up with the bottom up approach as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to ask Dr. Perpetua a, a question. Would those areas where there's high um, numbers of insecticide resistant mosquitoes, would the Provector be a, a practical application in those areas, in those homes and also outdoors? I, I didn't quite get that, Tom. And who is the question for? Uh, for Dr. Perpetua, she, she had mentioned that there's, you know, a lot of the bed net areas, insecticide treated net areas, they have to look at whether the mosquitoes are pesticide resistant to pyrethroids. Yeah, so, so, we're using, uh, so we're using the new uh, generation LLIs like the PBO nets and the interceptor G nets. So, we, we, so when we find that they're resistant to pyrethroids, there are newer tools in terms of, uh, of nets, bed nets that are available now. So rather than buying the PBO, uh, rather than buying the, the pyrethroid only nets, we order for these new newer generation nets that have uh, that are eff effective against the vector. That's what we do. When we have that information, we don't buy pyrethroids only nets. So we buy right. the, the, the next generation nets. Yeah. One of the, one of the things when I've visited in Africa, as was mentioned earlier, a lot of times people don't sleep under their bed nets, or we can't live under our bed nets. So we need something else in our home to help protect us. And that's Indoor residual spraying can, can be a method, but it can be costly. And uh, that's one reason I came up with the Provector flower was you just hang it up on the wall and it lasts there for three months. And so that, that would help people while they're outside making their cup of tea. Do you have any to show us, Dr. Colas? Um, I gave you the pictures. Yeah, we saw the picture. Okay. Um, yeah, I have one. It just so happens I have one right on my desk. I know you would. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. And there you go. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we have to explore that. Yeah, discuss it for that. It might be something that yeah. we will uh, have want to know more about in Nigeria. Actually. It's actually it's actually already registered in Nigeria with NAFTEC. I see. And it's available? Yes. I just need to find someone, to be honest, I have to find someone in Nigeria that's dependable because I've, I've, I'm just being honest. I keep, I keep going round and round with people. Dependable people online. The first lady there. And then, uh, oh, yes, but I'm just saying previously I've had some issues where I send them and all of a sudden they disappear. The national program would like to, to, to meet with you and discuss this further so that we you can even do a demonstration and uh, possibly we look for how we can pilot this as well in the country. Excellent. You know, thank I you. think it's something we want to explore, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Excellency. 
well, in the meantime, please, um, where can we get a sample or at least something to try? The pro vector is, since you say we already have them in Nigeria. Yeah, I just sent some to uh, Dr. Uh, our Reverend Nug John Uga uh, a couple of months ago. Which state is and, that? Oh, so how I'm sorry, I don't remember, but I, I had it registered a long time ago. It's kind of a long story, but a company tried to steal my stuff and I, I almost went bankrupt. I went from making about $300,000 a year to $8,000. I lost my home, my entire life savings. And while mm -hmm. I was in court, Peggy died two months before the case was settled. We didn't win any money, but I gained, I, I retained control of my product. And so now, and that happened in 2015, now we're expanding again to help children all over the world not die. My, my goal is saving lives to save souls. That's my goal. I'm glad you touched on that, Tom. How now do you now control China from hijacking this and flooding the market with... Um, oh, it, um, well, it's not that easy to figure out the recipe. Okay. It's, it's all EPA. I use EPA registered, US EPA registered pesticides. And then I combine them in a way that's very unique. So I'm sure they could figure it out, but it would cost them a million dollars. Of course, that's nothing in some of these countries. That's a, nothing. But to us, that's a lot of money. But uh, my, my main thing is, is not controlling my, see, they might be able to catch up to me. But if we can get out there and help people quickly, I, I'm not in it for the money. I need to take care of my family, but I'm not in it to make, to be honest with you, uh, when I was in court, a uh, contractor from Walmart contacted me and they offered me 75 to $100 million in sales a year if I would do an exclusive contract with them. One thing I learned not to do is exclusive contracts because of the other company. But I told them, I said, yeah, I can live on that. I said, uh, but let me be straight with you. The gospel of Jesus Christ is on all my products. And the guy said, you'll have to take that off. I said, that ain't happening. God gave me the idea. And my wife, she was so godly. She goes, Tom, you made the right decision. I thought she was going to slap me when I got home, <laughs> turning down $100 million. But yeah, I want to help people all over the world. And, and, the, and another thing, the outdoor products, the Provector tubes and, and the Super Nandy bottle. See, when you apply pesticides normally through air, aerial spraying, right? The next time it rains, it washes away. Yeah. And you have to go treat again. Yeah. Well, this lasts three months. In the environment, and then you just replace the bait pack. And the cost, custom. Let them know. Well, it, of course, it depends on the area. Um, I'm trying to keep them as low. The the super netty bottles, you want to use about six per um, quarter hectare. You know, so right around the home, and they they cost. I you know, if the person makes it themselves, that's the thing. It's recyclable, right? You use our water bottles, Coca Cola bottles. All I send is the paper and the bait. I even send the nail that the right size nail they can poke the holes in. They just tie it to a tree or to the house. So it, it costs about 75 cents for each, each contraption. And they last two to three months. And that's less, less than a dollar. Yeah. Yes, less than a dollar. Yeah. Cool. And then the flower, it costs about three, 350 to $4. I haven't, and that's another thing with this part here, I will make the bait pads but the local community can make the flower parts and I can give them. And so that provides jobs and it also reduces costs of shipping. So people can take it and make it themselves in these low income families. That's one of my goals also is to provide jobs so people can feed their families. That's a great, 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 um, strategy there and I know that a lot of people are going to pick that up from here now. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, please Dr. BC, will it be possible if we form a forum uh, on this so that we can start uh, creating the awareness well. from there? Yeah. yeah, I love that. We hit the ground running. Yeah, and uh, with the help of Her Excellency, I'm sure we will go far. I hope nodding. <laughs> we also have uh, Dr. Perpetua there. 
because we need the Federal Ministry of Health. I think the last time we spoke about this was the NAVDAC issue. The NAVDAC director was at that meeting. Remember, it was the Roadback Malaria meeting we had at ICRC. I don't know if you remember. Um, and, and one of the issues was, you know, getting it registered by NAVDAC. So, and that's done now. Um, on this note, I think I really must thank everybody for, you know, for the patients and not rushing off. Let me go back to my uh, panelists. Tell me, sorry, I won't call on you. Let me quickly go back to the panelists in case any of them want to add on anything. Um, we haven't heard much about COVID. I remember, I know that Dr. Lumesa mentioned it, you know, did we pick any lessons from that on how we are going to work on malaria differently? Um, what messages for government, what recommendations, any, you know, burning thing that, this is the opportunity, let's, you know, please, who goes first? Okay, I can just go first and um, I, I think, first of all, I want to uh, thank everyone and, um, and, and, and I think um, I must mention this, I keep talking about political will and political commitment. Um, having Her Excellency stay through this meeting is a sign of commitment. It's, it's and com it's not, we, we used to- She deserves a, a round of applause. She's, we used, we, we uh, used to yeah, having yeah, yeah. people come to open and then they're, of course we know they are busy and that's not to take away from them, but of course it just shows the level of importance and all of that. Yeah. Because not only has she contributed, she was came open to learn, to take, to strengthen what she's doing. So and I, I just hope that, that that continues. And of course, having those of perpetual also stay true. It's that's program, Nigerian program is not small. Yeah, it's been, it's not of things. I'm surprised that she's not had to take several phone calls while in this period. And so I, I think it was a great thing. And Tom, um, I, I just want to say that um, one of the key points that we have in the GTS is innovation. So we encourage innovation, we encourage um, um, you know, in innovation and new tools, better use of tools and all of that for us to achieve our goals. And um, of course, evaluated properly and all. And um, I, I think my last bit is thank you for such a forum, uh, BC, thank you for organizing this. Um, the, it's not malaria control and elimination, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Yeah. So we can't afford to remove our leg from the pedal. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Otherwise, you will lose the gains you have made in a month, in a matter of weeks, and you just see it evaporate. Yeah. And so we should be there for the long run and for the long haul. I want to appeal to our government, um, national government, state governments, and all. It is not a one-time investment. It's an investment mm -hmm. practically for life. Because even where you have eliminated, we are trying to prevent reintroduction. So thank you very much. And it's been a pleasure being part of this panel. Thank you so much, Dr. Lumese. Abena, you have um, something you want to add? Yeah, I think this was a, an excellent event. I actually wish it had been even more advertised more broadly because the, the knowledge and information has been amazing. And I look forward to working, especially with the First Lady and Dr. Perpetua on even more things to come. So I hope we can get in touch um, because I work already with a number of the panelists, so um, like Olivia and Dr. Olumisi. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I think there's a lot more work that can be done at the country level. And um, we just need to keep on doing more because there's just so much work that can be done in the area of malaria. And um, I can't overemphasize how much more needs to be done. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Abena. Um, who next? Thank you, uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. BC. And thank, thanks to all the uh, panelists. I mean, it's been great, uh, very uh, informative discussions that we've had uh, this afternoon. And uh, I look forward to uh, further collaboration with some of, uh, of, of your guests you know, also. And also to, to commend you, uh, BC, and your, your NGO on what you're doing. It's great. And uh, we are always available to collaborate with you. Thanks to Dr. Peter, the First Lady of River State, uh, uh, Thomas. That's a great invention. We would like to know more about it. And um, 
and everyone else it's been great and uh, thank you everyone and have a good afternoon thank you so much perpetua and i look forward to working with you for that on this um excellency you have yes. a word here yeah um it's been a long day i will say and but it has been an amazing uh, session i want to thank you bc especially for convening this um like you were saying this is my it has to do with my profession it's my passion yeah. and um <laughs> if i don't give this attention i don't know what else yeah. um i want to run off to so in in, in terms of priority for whatever I had on my uh, on my paper today, I prioritized this, okay. and um, it has paid off. I've enjoyed it. I have learned, and I'm um, I'm I'm happy to know that we have you. We have you there, and we have all these other people we have put together, and the rest of your team who are maybe um, uh, behind the scenes. Also, I want to thank them for making it possible, and. Um, um, for Mr. Thomas, please, I'm very, very, very keen on at least trying that pro vector uh, kit. Uh, if indeed you have it in Nigeria, please let us know. Maybe through Madam Bisi, I will be able to um, get hold of that, your, your person. Your... I can ship it to you. Okay, that would be very nice because I would like to try that. And I'm, I'm already thinking how it will make a difference in the in the hospital wards, for instance, because we yes. have a lot of even in the hospitals. Uh, patients go to the hospitals and return back with sec secondary infections, of, uh, malaria and stuff. So it will be. I, I was already thinking how that will make a, a, a difference in the hospital environment to begin we with. Also, we also mm. use it in schools in in Zambia. Mm, okay. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. That so, is that right? Public schools, yeah, we used it in schools in Zambia, Probably. and we, you know, we handed out. I think we've helped about three hundred thousand families in sixty countries over the years. Okay, okay. So please, um, I'm, um, I'm, I'm surprised to hear that it, got, it has been in Nigeria for some years, and then we have not heard of it. So please. Well, well nobody's selling it. Nobody's distributing. Yes, they I they want me to I'm sell also, it. To, I'm partly it. to blame. I, I accept that. Um, that's blame. Oh, uh, no, you helped me in the past so much. <laughs> I, I should have done more. Yes. That's okay. So, Abena, Abena Temilola, and um, uh, the, my colleague, Dr. Zoko Perpetua, and uh, our, uh, Dr. Lumese, all of you, Olivia. So, Olivia still there. Olivia I have... She had another meeting, so she had to run off. Wonderful, and I, I look forward to connecting with you if um, there will be need to, to you know, accelerate our fight against malaria. Like we rightly say, um, it, we are trying to drive it down to the zero level. It will be very nice if we can attain that because the burden of mal malaria is quite huge in, in, in our climb. Um, there's been a lot of noise over the last one year. Um, over COVID, yes, it, it was a pandemic, but if you look at the statistics, COVID, like in Nigeria particularly, COVID has just um, affected just over 165,000, but the last, from the statistics we have on malaria, um, 2019 statistics, which is uh, available, 61 million people were affected. So you can see the difference. So we have to make noise about what is most relevant, yeah. most important to us. So um, um, to, to re-emphasize that, I mean, I take this very seriously because we have a lot of otherwise preventable deaths accruable to malaria and we have to fight it. Mm -hmm. So malaria elimination is everybody's business and we have to key in one way or the other, every little matters. So thank you very much and God bless you all. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to invite, my colleague, Miss Noye, to round up for us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, thank you very much, Dr. Bisi Adebayo. I will observe protocol as I know it. Um, <laughs> so just thank you. I am really excited for Dr. Thomas Collas. I am so, so excited. 
I do intend to um, work very hard with Dr. Pisa Deba to um, really showcase what he's doing in the business community uh, back home in Nigeria. So that's fantastic. Again, uh, Temi Lola, that was really good. Your questions were just spot on, really <laughs> got everybody sitting straight up. You know, so <laughs> that was really good. Well done. And Dr. Peter Lumese um, and uh, our lovely Abina Poku, and again, the other doctors that have. Um, you know, logged off so wonderful, and everybody, everybody who's attended, uh, especially the um, you know the outer community of the BDG, we're so honoured to have you with us. We really are, and a, a huge shout out to the BDG community, the uh, board of directors, and everyone else. And yes, um, Her Excellency, I look forward to all your Excellency. I look forward. I don't really know which one to use at the moment. I'm so excited. So. <laughs> So um, it, it would be nice to hang out with you again and just see the wonderful, wonderful things you're doing in our beautiful Cross River State. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Yes, he's indeed um, a goodwill ambassador. We'll have to employ everybody to actually become an ambassador for malaria. Zero malaria. Mm. Malaria is preventable. And it's so sad that something so that we can easily prevent has gained so much ground and it's becoming so difficult to eliminate. It's, it's, really, it's really so sad. Mm. Um, but I know that we, we will get there eventually. Dr. Olumese has done so many years on this work. I know he understands the challenge and that's why he's probably smiling. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but you've also seen 30 countries attain zero malaria. And mm -hmm. that's encouraging. That's encouraging. Wonderful. So I think mm -hmm. I will hear more about how those countries did it, but there will be another opportunity. We'll come back again together to see what progress we've made. How many, how many states we've taken ProVector into We'll probably be presenting the, the results of the studies then. So on this yeah. note, I would like to end the, um, the session and thank every one of you from the bottom of my heart for staying on. It's almost three hours, but I've enjoyed every minute of it. I've learned. Thank you. Thank you, BC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. God bless you all and your families. Thank you. Thank you.